You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I think the way that, that I see it is we're all involved in the modern world. We're all in, interconnected in some way and we're all doing things, often doing things, that, that are damaging to other people. You know, you work in a pub, you're selling alcohol. We know that alcohol is just a, such a stone killer in our country, you know. You work in a tobacconist or a corner shop, you're selling, you're selling cigarettes. Um, I worked in the university sector for a long time and uh, kidded myself that uh, I was doing a good job for people who were coming to me to be taught. For the human mind, you know you're doing wrong. I always knew I was doing wrong, even though I knew drugs were destroying me. Why do people continue to do it though? Is that with the conditioning? Is that with the neural pathways then reprogramming the brain to just becoming the norm? Yeah, it's, a normal, it's, it's, it's an enormous buzz for people to do, to do wrong. I mean, early on, I think it, you know, it starts off early doors. It starts off when you're a kid and you're doing wrong and it's a buzz. When you get away with it, it's an absolute buzz. And some people get addicted to the chaos. I mean, for me, I don't like chaos. I like, I like order, you know, I like order in my life if I can get it. But, it, it, but, but for, for a lot of people, for young people in particular, you can get addicted to the chaos. When you talk to a bank robber, about getting hold of a gun, going into a bank and coming out with a quarter of a million pounds and then going somewhere warm and spending a quarter of a million pounds, you do start to wonder what that's like. You do start to wonder, oh dear me, you know, imagine having a quarter of a million pounds. You're not had to work for it. You're not had to wait for your pension lump sum in order to get hold of that money. You do start to think, and you start to think about yourself. You start to think, would I? Could I? I started to get to, to meet some of the more, if, if you like, the iconic names of people we know uh, through working in the media, through doing some media work. And um, I did some work in the 90s, um, I did some BBC work and um, came into contact with Frankie Fraser. Yeah, he was a proper villain. He was the real deal. He, he was the only one I've ever met. There was nothing about Frankie that wasn't to do with crime. Everything was to do with crime. Boom, we're on, and today's guest is Dick Cobbs. How are you, Dick? Hi, oh, James. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Lovely. So, so is it sociology? A professor in sociology, yeah, which right, is yeah. human behaviours, society, stuff like that? Yeah, how, how people interact within society, yeah, as opposed to psychology, which is mm. inside the head, yeah. I love all that stuff, like understanding the, especially the underworld and the criminal mindset, and so many different factors come into play, but you've just released a new book called The Business. That's this right. is your 10th book. That's number 10, yeah. This is different from the rest, or the rest was all kind of academic stuff? Yeah, yeah, I've worked in, as an academic for uh, over 30 years, and um, I produced books, they did well, they, they were good for my career, and, and um, they had an impact, I think, on the academic life, some, in some ways on um, social policy, a little bit on government, just a bit. But uh, I retired a few years ago, and uh, I decided that, uh, you know, I banged on all this time about... Um, working class people, getting them in university and uh, making it open access and, and, and that, that, that kind of thing. Successful to a certain extent, but my books were selling at 65, 80 quid, you know. They were going to academic libraries and they weren't reaching anyone else. So if a mate of mine said, uh, oh yeah, you've got this new book out, you know, Lush Life, 2013, yeah, well, I want to read that, you know, don't buy it. No, I'm going to buy it. And he'd come back, he'd say, Dick, it's 65 quid. I thought it was £6.50. No, mate, it's 65 quid. And I wanted to write in a way, I decided I wanted to write something that was going to be easily accessed to, to people that didn't have PhDs, that weren't part of the academic world. So that's what I've done over, over the last couple of years, and I worked on, on the business. So I've brought together uh, my research uh, that I worked on since the early 80s. I went to university in my 30s, uh, in the early 80s, and um, really started straight away looking at criminal life and uh, researching it. And uh, I've brought together this stuff that I've done really from, from the off, from the, from the start, and try to put it in a package which will be accessible to people. So all the information that you've gathered over the years, speaking with criminals, because you've spoke to some very high-profile cases, yeah. the Lond like, all the London criminals, all the, the bad boys of the UK, basically. And, but the business here is talking with thieves, gangsters and dealers. A fascinating, I must have, for those interested in my own line of work. That was quoted by Freddie Foreman himself. Freddie Foreman, yeah. But this is an interesting book. We'll promote this straight away. Where can people buy this, Dick? 
Uh, available in all good bookshops, and it's a bargain. Um, uh, Waterstones uh, on Amazon, uh, wherever it is a bookshop. Hopefully, it'll be it'll be in there. I always go back to the start of my guests, get to understand you and why you get into that kind of environment, lifestyle. But let's go right back to the start first and foremost, and find out a bit about yourself, brother, where you grew up, and how it all began. Yeah, I was um, I was born in uh, in in, in Plasto, which is West Ham, East, East London, and. Um, I was born in the early 50s, 1951 I was born, uh, in an environment which was kind of strange. I think one of the things that's always hit me about the way that working class culture, particularly London working class culture, is presented, it's always presented like a, an episode of Only Fools and Horses, where all jolly boys, boys and singing in the pub and doing dirty deals. Um, it wasn't quite like that, you know, that, that immediate post-war period was, uh, was grim. Um, bomb sites everywhere, um, shortages... Um, meat was rationed, I think, to the mid fifties. Um, it was tough, but more importantly, the people that were around me, my parents, the sort of life that they'd had, was w was really difficult. They'd come through in the nineteen uh, thirties with um, the depression, the economic depression. Then came the war, um, and they were either away fighting, as in the case of my dad, he was he was away for I think five years. He was out, he was out of the country. Uh, or, or like my, my mum and her family were, were at home being bombed. It was the East End, it was the Blitz, they were being bombed day and night. And, and when they came back, got together, got married and started to produce kids, there was a great deal of insecurity. And they hated insecurity. They'd seen death, destruction, poverty. They wanted to get away from all of that. So there was a big, big pressure on respectability. Not middle class respectability, not speaking with a plum in your mouth and becoming a bank manager. None of that. This was about doing as you're told, keeping your head down, work towards a job, don't get in trouble at school, work towards a job, and uh, do as you're told, and don't get into trouble. There was an enormous fear about the police. The police were not regarded as dicks in the dot green, friendly chaps who you could ask the time and, time and they'd pat you on the head and send you on the way. These, the, the police were regarded as, um, as, as quite dangerous. Um, don't let them in your house, don't get near them, don't, don't mess with the police because it will go wrong. And in my family, there have been incidences where it had gone wrong with um, older, older relatives and, and they clash with the police and, and uh, they come off worse. So there was this great pressure to do as you were told, but it was a very working class respectability. It wasn't about being posh, it wasn't about be, being middle class. And that was the sort of environment I was brought up in. It was very tight, it was very um, restrictive, very restrained. Um, but I was lucky in that um, my mum had uh, twins after, after me, uh, two, three years after me, she had twins, and uh, couldn't really cope with, with three young kids. So I went off to my grandparents, to her mum and dad, and that was a different ball game. It was, it was a different culture. It was, it was only down the road. It was only about a mile and a half away. But uh, they were veterans of a, an even deeper poverty. Uh, the old man had been in the First World War, he'd been in the trenches, he'd done all, all the stuff that his generation did. He was a trade unionist, he hated bosses, um, he was, he'd been unemployed, he'd been blacklisted by, the, by, the, um, uh, by bosses because of his trade union work. Uh, and he knew people, he, he, and he'd take me out for walks. Most days we'd, he'd take me out for walks and we'd go down, we'd go down Queens Road Market, which is Upton Park, the old market, which was a street market. And he knew people, he saw people, he chatted to people, and it was a bit more easy going. It was a bit more easy going. And, and there was a group of men that he spoke to and uh, just outside Upton Park Station, and, and um, he'd speak to them every time, and they were very respectful to him. And uh, they, wore, they were incredibly well-dressed, um, smartly dressed, trilby hats, big overcoats, dark suits underneath. And I, I couldn't understand their language, the way they were speaking. They spoke very quickly. I couldn't quite catch them. They always wanted to give me some coins, which I gratefully tried to grab off of them. But um, the, old, the old man said, no, no, he's all right. He doesn't need it and everything. And he was connected to them. It was years later when I started to do research and started to chat to people and find out what was going on. It was years later that I found out these were street bookies, um, thieves, villains generally. And that particular part of, of, Upson, of, of, of the East End was, was, was a gathering place. And my grandfather knew him, and, and he was at ease with him. And, and there was a different atmosphere between his attitude to life and mum and dad's attitude to life, which was, be careful, do as you're told, you know, don't get into trouble. Well, he seemed a little bit more easy going, and he had some stories. And over the years, I started to pick up stories from him and my other grandfather and older relatives about... Um, uh, 
boxing, booth boxing on Mile End Waste, which one of my grandfathers did for money. Um, uh, bits of ducking and diving, fighting in Victoria Park, uh, coming up against um, uh, pickpockets, and, and, and it was story, story, story started to emerge. And as you, you know, when you're a kid, you just absorb things. You just pick them up, a word here, a, a comment there. So I started to, to get this idea that there was a world outside which where everybody didn't do as they were told, where people actually did take liberties, where people took a few risks. And I started to get interested at that point. Meanwhile, I'm sort of timid, sort of very timid sort of kid, and I didn't want to get in trouble because I was going to get a good idea if I got home and got in trouble. But I became interested in those that did. Even then, I can see now that that's where it, it, it kind of started for me. So that's, that was the beginning, that was the start. Of so there was always an interest from a very young age of the villains, the yeah. people who were kind of trying to fly under the radar, yeah. the fancy suits. That's a, it's like a, <clears throat> it's not a turn on, but there's something about that life where you see it. When, when I grew up in Glasgow, you see them with the convertibles, the nice girlfriends, you yeah. think, wow. Because when you're living in poverty, you see that and you think, I need a piece of that. But yeah. It's the wrong kind of people to live up to because it, as the years went on, the majority of them died or were in prison. Their girlfriends end up haggard with all the beatings and all the bullshit because it was low vibrational people involved in a life that they think is going to cure whatever it is. Yeah, they got battling. a short, short sell by day. Yeah, you know, it's a short sell by day. And and I was, I, I was hanging around uh, at school, particularly at primary school. I remember there was there was some big families when they were around there at the time and. If you had, you know, playground scuffles or fights or anything, some of those playground scuffles could turn into a visit to A and E, you know, because these these boys were, were were wild. They were they were fighters. They came from families of fighters, and anyone who took them on, if you won or you hurt one of them, then there was always a bigger brother, an older brother, a cousin, an uncle, or there'd be some, you know, there'd be some uncle come out of a basement somewhere. They'd bring him out in chains and let him loose, yeah. and and there was a lot of it. And that was working class culture then. It was that post war era. And, and um, there was still poverty around, but it was beginning to fade. And I think that was the other thing that that had a big impact on my on my childhood and my interest in crime was that um, for the first time in the fifties, the East End started to look good. The, the East End entered a kind of golden age. It previously, had been involved with there'd been poverty, uh, there'd been racism, there'd been all these kinds of things going on. It had become a dark, it was a dark place, place of uh, of disease, of illness short life lifespans but there was a there was a, a brief blip in the 50s into the 60s um when things were thriving and it was mainly due to the docks you know it's the biggest docks in the world um stuff was coming and going from the from 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 the docks there was work there was plenty of work so the environment that i was brought up in there was plenty of work i didn't see poverty i saw people that didn't have much but nobody had very much we didn't have bathrooms or hot water or anything like that but nobody else had it either but people had work and they could put food on the table for their families and, and that had a big impact and people started to spend money and as I got older I noticed that the pubs were always thriving it was always noise and music coming out of pubs uh, people were well dressed it was a smart culture I think all working class cultures you know at that particular time you had to dress smartly, and people did dress smartly. They spent their money on their kids. They looked smartly. Uh, they looked smart, and and it was, you know, something was going on there. There was money there, but there was also an amazing amount of thieving that went on from the docks. And as I, as I got older, you, you came into contact with this. There was always someone who had something to sell, or was looking for something to buy. Everyone was at it. And when I got as I got older and, and went into to, to pubs and. There was always a corner of the pub where there was someone, a woman with a box of shirts. There was one, there was one pub I used to go into. Where there was a woman there. They used to call her Sally Shirt, and uh, the landlord called her, the landlord called her uh, Stratford's answer to uh, Liz Taylor because she looked like she had dark hair and there was always a cloud of smoke around. And she always had this cigarette hanging out hang, hanging out of her mouth, and she worked in a in a shirt factory and she was always nicking boxes of shirts. So if you wanted shirts for your kids for school uniform or whatever, you went to Sally Shirt. And you bought them at a bargain price, and she was a bit of a local celebrity. You know, she that was that was quite important. There was another woman down the street that I used to, a mate of mine lived um, two streets away, and he used to go down there and play football in the street with him. And there was a woman in in the, in the corner house. I'll never forget her. And we used to call her Mrs. Popeye, and she looked like Popeye. Uh, she had no teeth, 
Um, she had muscles, she had tattoos on her arm, cigarette hanging out of her mouth, and there was always cars and vans pulling up outside her house. Boxer come out, boxer come out, boxer come out, boxer go in, the van, go away, it went. And it, it was later on that you, you kind of realised that she was, she was a receiver. But what she was receiving was, um, it was stolen goods, nothing elaborate, no gold bars or anything like that. It was, uh, there was Madison's Meat Pie Factory was, near, was close to us. So there was always meat pies going in there. Um, shirts, again, clothing. Um, and Yardley's Perfume, because Yardley's Perfume Factory was down the road at Stratford. And um, the whole place stank of meat pies and perfume. You know, that was, that was what my, my area was like. And a few chemical works thrown in. And a couple of abattoirs as well now, I think of it. So it did stink. And, uh, but that was Mrs Popeye. That's what she, she traded in. And um, she was at it. And everybody was at it. And there was an attitude to... It was like a, it was, it was a kind of city ethic, a street ethic that I, that I later picked up from, from other big cities, particularly big cities that had ports where goods were moving all the time. There was always someone who had something to sell, something to buy. So I started to pick up on that stuff as well. So that became important. Is that a battle of like survival mode? People just willing to do what it takes to put food on the table and provide for their family? What's it like? I always speak about people being a product of their environment as well, like all the bad people, like people who turn bad. Everybody, I believe, always has got goodness in them. They just certain circumstances, certain bits of trauma that can then trigger things to then lead them down a different path. What do you think about people making their own choices, though? If you become a product of your environment, is there come a stage when you go, OK, I'm old enough to make my own choices, or they totally programmed their brain into thinking and doing what they're actually doing, and they can't really adjust to what they're doing is bad? Well, that ducking and diving culture was absolutely in- ingrained. It was, it was branding in- into the walls of the, of the East End, particularly my bit of the East End. So it was absolutely everywhere. You, you couldn't get away from it. And you wanted to engage with it because you wanted to be smart. You wanted to be one of the boys. You wanted to be part of it. You didn't want to pay full price for anything. You know, th- th- that was the idea. You know, you had, you had to buy something. Well, where can I get it cheap? Who can get it? And you often didn't ask if it was not tough or why, why would you bother doing it? A good example of that was my, my as I said, my, my family were very straight, very strict, very tight. And um, my mum was a dressmaker. She worked from home. And um, the guy over the road was a docker. I remember being in bed one night and, and about 10 o'clock, there was a knock on the door. Well, in those days, it's before, te- before we had a telephone or anything, you got a knock on the door at 10 o'clock, something bad had happened, someone had died or whatever. And it was Mickey from over the road. And he, and he, and he said, oh, Mary, I've got some cloth for you, like last time. Oh, I don't know if I want any cloth. What's it like? Oh, it's really good. It's great. You'll love it. And it's great. I've got it here. Yeah, it looks okay. It's not knocked off, is it? So she had to get through this. I later on when I became an academic, learned to phrase as a neutralisation technique. You take the crime out of it. It's not knocked off, is it? Knowing full well that it is. And he'd, he'd go through this pantomime. And he'd say, ah, yeah, 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 of course it's not knocked off. You know, I got it from the, the auctions, just like last time. Oh, well, that's all right then. Put it in the front room. So people can always neutralise it and always take the edge off of it. They take the badness out of it. But for young people coming through, for young people coming through, you didn't want to take the badness out of it. You liked it because it gave you an edge. And it, it, made you feel, it made you feel like a wheeler dealer. You know, you could look at these older guys who had money. You could look at the guy in the pub on a Friday night who was selling, you know, we had down the road in, in the docks, we had the biggest cold store in the world, in the road docks. And the pub, just on the corner of my street, on a Friday night sold more meat than jewels. You know, it was just amazing to go in there. Everyone got their Sunday roast or legs of lamb or whatever. That's where you, that's where you got it. So you could look at that guy and say, oh, I fancy being like him. He's, you know, he's got a nice, sh- nice suit on and he's doing well. There was no badness in it. You didn't see it as a bad thing. Later on, and no one seemed to be getting nicked. That was the thing. You know, when you're a kid, I didn't see anybody getting arrested for stealing things or for dealing, or for, for dealing in, in stolen goods, uh, being a receiver. That never occurred. It never occurred at all. It was later on that people started to get nicked. When you got, got into my 20s, then I started to see things going wrong. But that, that, uh, those early stages, stolen goods, knocked off gear, all of that stuff, that was just part of life. It was How do you think there wasn't many people getting caught? Was that because you were oblivious to it or because there was not as many people doing it? There was, everyone turned a blind eye. I mean, it was the city of the blind eye. And you, the, the, the police weren't too concerned. Mind you, if they did know you, if they were going to nick you, they did nick you and you went away. But it was rare. You know, they... Stolen, there was stolen stuff everywhere. There was lorry loads. If you, if you wanted to be 
at the sharp end and wanted to make a lot of money, it was a lorry load. If you were just an ordinary person, it was a pocket load. You know, I can remember all kinds of things that came out of the docks. And sometimes, I remember being in a, in a, in a friend's house and his, his dad, who was a docker, came home from work. I was playing now at primary school. And um, he came home and I thought, oh, he's put on weight. He took off his donkey jacket and he took a sweater off. And he took another sweater off. He had eight sweaters on. He had eight sweaters on. And um, he just smiled at me. And I'm like, all oh, right, it's been a work. That's, that was it. And it was just like normal. And he was a very normal guy, a law-abiding man. Um, a, a man who looks after his family, didn't get involved in crime other than, you know, dipping into a crate. Crate dipping, they called it. Yeah. You know, that, that was it. My dad used to do that. I used to wear the duffel coats, but I used to steal LPs. Oh, yeah. All the LPs fill it up because there was no cameras, nothing in hand. They used to dip the towels, stuff like that. It was just survival. But for me, that was the norm when they were telling those stories. It's all family men, friend, friends, members, all shoplifters, and it was just normal to... Then you get old and you still think, but it's still somebody's business. It's yep. somebody's going. There's always yep. consequences, and you're saying they take the the meaning out of it. Is that because they don't want to feel as bad because they, they genuinely know what they're doing is wrong? I think as much as anything, they don't want to be scared. They want to go to bed at night and sleep. You know, mm. I think that. I think that was. I think that was it at, at this stage. I, I think that. I think that was. That was that was pretty much it. Can you block that out in your mind that you're doing something wrong and put it away somewhere, but the brain still knows what you're doing? What's wrong about it? It's a bargain. Yeah. And actually, that's how it that's how it comes across. You know, you you're doing something. You're getting money uh, for as a young kid. People are getting money. They want to spend it on clothes and drink and whatever. You know, the usual stuff teenagers want to do. For older people, it's uh, well, you put the money aside and you, you're having a caravan holiday in Clacton or whatever, and you put the money aside and you're going to have two weeks instead of one week and that kind of stuff. So it was, it was extras. It was born of poverty. It was, it was a culture that people inherited from back when real deep poverty was in the East End. And it was. It was an extremely poor place. Every city had these poor places. And the East End is, was, was London's. Um, and it was a big area as well, you know, in my, my borough in... Borough of Newham, which is East Ham and West Ham, 300,000 people live there, and that's a sizable city. It's big. You know, take on Tower Hamlets and Hackney on top of that. The East End is a big old chunk. It's a big old chunk. Now, that culture that, that had been passed on, really from the 19th century right the way through the 20th century, and, and I was picking up on it, I guess the tail end of it, into the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, that's something you inherited, that way of doing things. And I think one of the things, you know, you said about the... Um, it's someone's business and you're doing someone down and you're taking from it. I think the thing with the docks, my dad didn't work in the doc, docks, by the way. He, he didn't work in the docks, but most people around me did, and we have relatives that did. And the thing with the docks was that it was casual work. So you, you turned up for work in the morning and you didn't know how much work you were going to get. You might get a day's work, you might get a week's work, and then you might get another week's work, or you might go a week without any work. And this had gone on forever, so it was casual Daily, daily employment, very, very difficult. Difficult to plan, difficult to look after your family, difficult to pay bills. So when people stole from, from the docks, they didn't feel they were stealing from an employer because the distance between you and the employer was enormous. It was, they were somewhere out there. You didn't know. It wasn't like working in a factory where you were, you'd see the employer and you'd see the hierarchy, the, man, the under manager, the manager and the owner. You didn't see that in the docks. It was a huge area, massive area, and you were moving from you were moving from 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 ship to ship. So it was all, it always changed. So it didn't feel when I spoke to people since and talked to them about when they used to steal from the docks. It didn't really feel they were stealing from a person. It was just there, and you picked it up and took it home, and that was it. Smart door. Huh? Yeah. Think with yeah, but it made sense. Yeah, of course it makes sense, but again, it's still. Somebody's load, it's still somebody's shipment, it's still somebody in the docks who's maybe signing it off and something's went missing. There's always consequences of yep. other people getting bothered or yep. people getting sacked. Or, because I know people who sold a mass amount of drugs and they, in their mind they think because they don't touch it, they're not doing anything sure. wrong. I don't sure. touch it, I don't pass it on. Yeah, yeah. But you're still sitting at the top of the team, yeah. still yeah. orchestrating it to then destroy other lives to then benefit your own. I think the way that, that I see it is we're all involved in the modern world. We're all in, interconnected in some way and we're all doing things, often doing things, that, that are damaging to other people. You know, you work in a pub, you're selling alcohol. We know that alcohol is just a, such a stone killer in our country. You know, you work in a tobacconist or a corner shop, you're selling, you're selling cigarettes. Um, I worked in the university sector for a long time 
and uh, kidded myself that uh, I was doing a good job for people who were coming to me to be taught. But a lot of the people who came to me to be taught were quite privileged people. You know, I, why am I helping them? Why am I doing that? Why aren't I going? Yeah, we all make compromises. We all make compromises, and, and, and they're not good compromises, and they can chew away at your head. But that's what happens. I think what happened with the kind of culture that I'm talking about, which is typical of, you know, Glasgow, Liverpool, big cities, yeah. big cities. Um, what happened when, when that, um, that stealing culture and that receiving culture, those networks of stolen goods, when that went, and, it, and when it went, it, it had a big impact. Because everybody was interconnected. Everybody knew everybody. You could have a box of shirts or whatever, or you didn't want a box of shirts. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. So you had that. When that went, when the docks closed down, it was empty. You know, the, the, the lorry parks were gone. The lorries, you know, I, I used to know people who were jump up merchants and they, was, they lived on the back, in the back of a lorry. You know, they were just, that's what they did. When the, lorries, when the lorry parks went, when the warehouses went, there was nothing except drugs. Because when they went, when all of that old economy disappeared, the jobs went. You had people without money again. And they've been used to money. Their families were used to money. They were used to a holiday. They might have a car. They might be living in, in decent accommodation for the first time. They were the first generation. But suddenly it was gone. What are we going to do? Where's the jobs going? You can't go down to the docks and earn a decent living and a bit on the side and all the rest of it. That's completely obliterated. That's disappeared. So what are you going to do? And with unemployment came drugs. They came side by side with each other. It, it, it just did. And the most unusual people I saw were starting to make money. People who were um, really disrespected as families. Families are drunks. Family, families are no marks. Never worked. Never really had any money. No one took them seriously. Um, suddenly they, they were making money. So all they had to do was pick up a parcel from A and deliver it to B. And they had a lot of money in their pockets. So suddenly you start to see bars go up and windows. They were buying dogs called Tyson. They had a big car out, a big 4x4 out the front. And they came out of nowhere. So you had those families were coming through, but also some of the old families who had, who had been involved in, in, in lorry loads out of the docks and in lorry loads from, from warehouses and things, they adapted to the drugs trade as well. But that mentality of ducking and diving, wheeling and dealing, they just reapplied it to drugs. Avoid missing, so they did something else. They didn't realise the, the extent, how much and far. Do you think everything's planned though? Okay, we'll stop this. We'll bring in the drugs and know how far it will spread and how easily it will spread. No, nah, not got a clue. They're not, not. They're not analytic. Not them, but the people who are pulling the strings to them be shipping that stuff over. They, yeah, I think you, you do see more analysis. I mean, when, when I got through the, you know, my early my early work was on was on ducking and diving culture, and it was also on detectives and how they how they cope with it, how they dealt with it, and how they were affected by it. So I was in pubs, in clubs, talking to people, seeing what was going on. But as I moved on, I started to see people get more professional. You got into the 90s, the, the, the ducking and diving, the, the, um, the, the, the Sally shirts of this world, if you like. They were kind of fading away. They, they, they were gone. They'd moved out of the area for a start. The area emptied out. All these resources, all these smart, sharp people. We did a bit of ducking and diving, but, but basically good family people looked after their families and were part of the community. They disappeared. They moved out of the area. They, they went. And... As the, 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 this new uh, uh, economy started off, as the new, new economy got going, the drugs economy got going, I started to look at other countries as well, and I eventually started to look at um, importation. And you could see that there was far more thought going in at the point of... Uh, not always at the point of importation. So if you're talking about heroin, you're not talking about Afghanistan. or not necessarily, There was some going on in Turkey, but you saw it along the way. You saw it along the way. So as the drugs are moving in through the Balkans, really it's, a, it's almost a separate, um, a separate deal, a separate enterprise. It gets to Romania, it gets to Bulgaria, it's a separate enterprise. Then it moves on, it gets to Greece or it gets to Amsterdam. It's a separate enterprise. They're buying and selling and buying and selling and buying and selling. So at each point, yeah, people are strategic. And one of the reasons they're strategic is if it goes wrong, they're going away forever. If, they, if it goes wrong, they're going away for 22 years, 25 years, 18 years, whatever. They're going away for a long time. It's not like being found with a, a box of shirts where you might get a fine in magistrate's court, worse ways. It's different. It's more serious. It's more serious. 
it's tenser, it's tighter. It's not part of the community. You can't go into a pub. I mean, I used to, several of the pubs that I used to go into, they were like uh, open-air bazaars. You know, everyone was buying and selling. They had something to sell. Sometimes it was nicked, sometimes it wasn't. But they were open. It was quite open. It was quite, quite open. That changed. That changed. When you're talking about drugs, you're talking about big sentences. So people were starting to take things far more serious. And it had an impact on the, on the community. Instead of walking down the street and you'd know people, suddenly there were bars on the windows, people didn't know people, you got movement of, you didn't know your neighbours, you got movement out of the community and into the community. I mean, the, the borough that I talked about, the borough of Newham, 300, just over 300,000 people, a third of that population now churns every year, a third. So you've got 100,000 people coming in or moving out or moving around. They're not staying put. So you don't know your neighbour. You, 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 you take your kids to school, it, the kid doesn't know the kids at the school. Everything became more um, delicate in a way. It, 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 became, it became very problematic. Do you think it became more evil then? Because you look at the consequences, it's, nobody's going to get life in prison for stealing a shirt or selling a shirt. They're not going to get murdered for owning somebody the money or a sh for a shirt or a, a rack of lamb. Yep. But then the consequences of owning somebody money for drugs, the shipments getting caught, People want to fight over each other's turf to get more yeah. punters, more money, means more problems, more evil into the world. Do you think that's when things started spiraling then? Yeah, it did. Um, there, there was did always you see the this violence. the seventies, early eighties kind of thing? Yeah, it, it it by the time we get through to the mid eighties, you can see Heroin. by then we are we are in in the UK we we, we are um, world leaders. Uh, drug use, you yeah. know, um, lager and drugs. It's, we're good at it, you know. It's the one thing we're good, we, we're good at. Why do you think that is? Um, do you think that's? I always call it an escape. But what, what's your opinion? I think on it's. That? A, I think it's escape. You know, it's a repressive. We, we've been a repressive society for an awful long time, and we let we like to let rip. I mean, if you've got I've got friends who are American, they come over here. I used to work at University of Durham, and I'd take them into Newcastle on a, on a, on a Friday night, and they, they thought they couldn't understand what was going on. You know, it's wild, <laughs> wild, wild, in <laughs> a big market. You yeah. know? It was wild stuff. And it could have been in any city. It was in Newcastle. It could have been in any city. And uh, we, we do let rip. You know, you try doing that in an American city, you're going to get shot. You're going to get clamped down on. It's very tight, you know, unless you go to New Orleans. And even then, the, the kind of looseness is, is regulated in, 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 a, in a way. But when, the dr when drugs came in, um, a lot of the old violence re re kind of rejigged itself. It had always been a violent area, you know. It, it just had. The violence was around everywhere. People got whacked at home, they got whacked at school, they got, they, they, they got in fights in, in the street. It affected everybody. It affected whether you were a good fighter or a bad fighter or whatever. I mean, from my point of view, the time I got into, um, I think, my, my mid-teens, I, uh, I was quite social. I was good at... I was a nodding acquaintance with the right people, put it that way. And, and I was fantastically quick from a standing start if I needed to be as well at night. You know, I was pretty quick. So you, you learn to cope with it. It's, it's not all about doing the violence. It's about being aware of it, being aware of the, uh, the possibilities. A, a student of mine called it the choreography of violence, you know, how it's moving. Is it going off? Why are they talking to each other? Why are they moving? Why are they putting their hands in their pocket? Why are they doing it? And I got, in, I got interested in, in all of that as well early on. And certainly... In the late 60s, when I was starting to go out a, a lot more, uh, there was a phase that we went through, you'll be familiar with this from Glasgow, of, of open razors being used. You know, it became quite a, a popular quite a popular thing. And I became fascinated in seeing, because that's a choreograph thing, you put your hand in your pocket, they often had a case. And I remember one particular uh, place that was, um, was when Harrington jackets had first come out, and they had a nice pocket inside, and these guys were taking cases out taking the razor out, putting the cases back in their pocket and opening up. And it was very elaborate. It was theatrical, the way they were doing it, you know. And then they were maiming people in some cases, you know. They, they, were, they were lopping bits off of each other. And that went on. So I became interested in that. And I, so I saw all of this. By the time we got into the drugs trade, a lot of these, these people who were, who were good at violence and had reputations for violence were able to apply those reputations to the drugs trade. They were adaptable. They, they wanted to make money. They wanted to make big money. They weren't happy with a box of shirts or a leg of lamb. They were into making big money. And if you had a violent reputation, 
that was fantastic. And some most unusual people, quite conservative people who were anti-drugs, against drugs, thought drugs was a dirty thing, it was to do with hippies or students or people out there, not us EastEnders, us solid working class people, they got involved in drugs as well because that was the way to make money. What do you think of the violent mindset? People always ask me the question, do you not get scared interviewing some murderers and bank robbers? But I don't because what I see is weakness, I see vulnerability, I always say this stuff, but there's always a connection. Every bad man has either been bullied or abused when they're younger. For me, personally, for what I've learned over the last few years interviewing people, holding a gun or a knife becomes a defence mechanism. Because they're so broken, they don't want to feel pain or hurt anymore, so they deflect it away to try and drill fear into other people because they're so filled with fear. What do you think of the violent man, the one who wants to be angry, the one who wants to hold the gun or walk about with the open razor and keep the hand in the pocket as if he's holding something? Yeah. For me, the people who shout and scream is a weak man. That's vulnerability. I, I don't see strength in that. I believe there's a time and a place like the craze who still get spoke about, which we'll touch on later in the interview, mm -hmm. that they were very well known for their violence. But for me, they weren't well organised. A lot of darkness around them as well. You've got families out there who do bigger things, move bigger bits that nobody hears about. But what do you, what's your opinion on the violent mindset? Can that be something uh, chemical imbalance, or could it be what is it in your opinion? I think the the, the violent criminal it comes together. There's, there's several different angles that it comes from, without a doubt. A lot of abuse out there, a lot of abuse. When you talk to the older villains now, uh, and they're looking back, they've maybe not got long to go, they've had hard lives, they've served every time. They're looking back and, and wondering, how did I get here? And they're normally quite open, I've found them quite open about what happened to them early on. Maybe they weren't abused at home, maybe they had really good, happy family lives, maybe that was okay, but something happened outside, something would happen outside. I know several people, for instance, who were uh, stopped by the police they had jobs or they were doing well at school, happy at home, not rich people, but doing well in ordinary working class homes. And then they got picked on by the police. They got picked on by the police. And once they get picked on by the police, they go, okay, you treat me like a bad man, I'll show you how bad I can be. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bobby Cummings, for instance, who went, who went on to have a, a very interesting life. That's how he started off. He had, a, he had a job, I think, in a shipping office. Bobby's the same age as me. He had a job in a shipping office. He was doing well, he was doing, you know, he was doing fine. And then he got picked on by the police. He got picked on by the police and he got stitched up. They, they planted a razor on him um, and he lost his job. And he thought, well, I'm going to react to that. If you want bad, I'll show you bad. And Bobby's up, as so many of these re genuinely old men are, not a big man. He's about five, 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 six, I think, something like that. And um, in no time, he's using, a weapon. He's, he's using weapons. And that's quite typical. Then you get the, the family abuse and you get the, the, the hard father or the, 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 the father who knocks the kids about and, and that's a reaction. It's a kind of, I better get him first. You know, I better get my retaliation in first because I know what it's like. I'm going to get beaten up. I'm going to get hit. But you do get people who like it. It's recreational. For them, violence is, a, is recreational. It's something they're going to do. And I saw people when I was young who would go out and to have a fight, that was, that was what the night out was about, you know, that, that was what it was about. And as they got older, they learned that their reputation that they, that they got from fighting when they were 16, 17, 18, they could apply that reputation to making money. You commodify it, you take the reputation and you, and you commodify it. It's just like a, a kid who's naturally talented at football and, and dad comes along and says, I'm gonna take you along to this club, we're gonna make money out of your talent, that's it. The same thing happened with these guys with, viol with, with violence. Now you get a group of these blokes together who are all the same, and they come through when they're 14, 15, 16. If they're still together when they're 25, 26, they're gonna be a force to be reckoned with because they're, they're in that mindset that everything's gonna be sorted out from violence. There's no negotiations. You don't need to negotiate. You just take it. So I, think, I don't think there's one type of violent offender. I think they come together from, from similar backgrounds, but these different pressures are on them. The abuse thing is important. Uh, police picking on them is important as well, which is why I'm very wary about this stop and search business because you do that too often to someone, they're gonna react. Um, but also the, the, the recreational side of it, you know, they like it. I mean, a huge number of pe people that I know who've got involved in serious violence started off in boxing. You know, this idea of that boxing keeps kids off the streets, it does, and it's a good thing. 
But a lot of those guys started off as boxers. You know, you look at the Crays, you look at the Richardsons, and endless numbers of them started off that way. So I think it's 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 quite varied. Yeah, it's, like people can go to boxing, it can change their mindset, it can mature them, it can give them some sort of structure in their life, some sort of meaning. Same as like people go to karate, taekwondo, yep. whatever it is, to give a bit of, not confidence, but no matter what you do in life, there's always going to be two flips of the coin, good, bad, yep. whatever it is you do. But it's just to un- try and understand and break it all down for people to get. Like I believe any human can kill anybody. Everybody's got good and bad in them. Everybody's got us. But like, you can have the nicest person on this planet, but if you harm their their, their kids in front of them, everybody's got a, a point where they go enough's enough. Sure, people have this have a snapping point. What was the fascination, though? Fascination, fascination for yourself to then go down that route of try to understand the lifestyle of wheeling and dealing criminality. Well, I, I went, I left school with with nothing much, a couple of O levels. It took me, I had to stay on an extra year at school to get the the two the two O level the two O levels. So. I went to work, and uh, at that particular point, uh, late 60s, the way to, uh, there was a lot of office jobs, a lot of awful, terrible office jobs, like filing clerk, messenger, T-boy. And uh, I went into that, as did most of my friends, but we all came out of it. I don't know any of us who stayed in office work at all. And I stayed in that for about 18 months. I did that in different, in different settings, and it was terrible. I hated it. And a lot, of, a lot of my friends had connections. They knew people. They knew people that could get them in in a building trade. They knew people who could get them in this job, that job. I knew nobody. I was going absolutely nowhere. So um, I eventually uh, I, I turned towards labouring. I was a dustman. I was a road sweeper. And that was all good. Those jobs were good because there was a lot of ducking and diving in those jobs. And I was watching it, and that was interesting. And I did that for a few years, and then I started to go to night school. And um, uh, I became a teacher. Um, a school teacher went back to the East End became a school teacher for for four years Um, but it wasn't enough for me I I wanted more I'd had a little bit of learning at uh, teacher training college which was terrible really I mean I remember one day the level of teacher teacher training college was terrible one day we did face painting so there was there was 35 people adults in this class with painted faces you know because we had to do that because that's what you were going to do with the kids if you went into a class it was terrible it was dreadful but I always fancied proper learning, if you like, as I thought of it, proper learning. I fancied university. I fancied, I fancied seeing how far I could go. So when I was 30, I, I, I sort of, I did actually bluff my way into, into uni, um, used my teacher training uh, qualification to get into university. And I started to study, and, and it was hard then, because it was, I was in my 30s, and I, I, had a, I had a mortgage, I had a way of life, I had the little luxuries like hot food and clean clothes, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and I, I, I found it quite difficult, but I went to uni and I started to read and, and I found that the way that working class life was presented was, was not right. It was one dimensional. Um, I didn't like it. So, and I started to realise that maybe I've got something to offer with my experience and my knowledge of, of that life, of that world. Uh, and, and my willingness to, I, I had a great work ethic, still have, I can work seven days a week. Uh, after a couple of months, I, I regret it, but I do it, I can do it, and I found that I could do it then, out of fear, you know, because I was scared I was going to fail. I was 30 year old. Um, people that I knew locally were saying, you're a bit old to be a fucking student, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, well, I am, you know, so can, can we have a chat about what you're up to, you know, can you have a chat about how you get into a container and how you seal it up afterwards, and can you tell me that? So I started to do all of that stuff, and it worked. It worked for me. And um, I started to, to look at, at, at Really, what, was, what had happened to some of the people that I knew when I was 15, 16, by now they're in their 30s, approaching 40, some of them, and uh, where are they now? What are they doing? How, how has their life changed? What, what, are they, what are they up to? Are they still ducking and diving? And some of them were. Some of them were getting involved in some serious crime, and some of them had done some serious bird as well. So, oh, that's interesting. And um, I came across a guy, I met a guy called Terry Jackson, and Terry, uh, Terry and I got on well he looked like um he was like bob hoskins on steroids you know he was a terrific guy great company best man to be in a pub with ever and um i got in with him and he was a thief terry was a thief and um and a good one as well and he started to tell me bits and pieces and to introduce me to people and it, it kind of came together in my 30s this yeah i can do something here and it no one else is doing it no one else is doing it you know i, I love academic work I, I love to study i, I think it's a you know i'm 
I'm, I'm grateful that I, I had the opportunity to go and to study and to work in that field. It was absolutely great. But I'm also very pleased that I had the opportunity to, to come up with something different, something new. But it was via people I knew. Some, in some cases, people I'd known for most of my life. In some cases, new people that I was meeting. And that's really, that's, that was really it. And I was seeing the East End change around me. You know, it was changing. The docks had gone, everyone, as I said, you know, everything, everything was changing. Where are they going? How are they coping? Um, how are you going to, you know, you've plundered that lorry park on a regular basis for the last 10 years. What are you going to do now? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And also seeing their kids come through. So I've stayed really close to some of those people for a long time now, for a long, long time, since before I, was, uh, I became an academic and I've known their I've known them, I've known their families, their wives, their girlfriends, I've known their kids, their grandkids, in one case their great grandkids. And I'm seeing how they're changing, how they've adapted. And that's where the drugs things comes in for me. It's, it's really quite interesting. You get people who are good duckers and divers, jumping at the back of lorries, life and soul at a party, always got something to, to sell, always got plenty of gold around their neck, and you know, good old boys and, and all the rest of it. Their kids, that wasn't there. The lorry parks were, were there. You know, what are they going to do? And they had problems. You know, they had problems. Their grandkids, even more so. And I've seen, I've seen some of these guys with, with grandkids who are, who are doing serious bird, who are doing sevens, thirteens, inside for violence associated with drugs. People who move big shipments. I know people in who's just to shift small bits of gear, box here few kilo here and they used to think they were big time players and I start speaking to people who then shift and fit 5,000 boxes and absolutely caning that. Do you feel as if people, how would people be selling drugs, using the entrepreneurship skills to then moving it to something else? Do you think they would still have that same business module, same business strategies to be cream of the crop or is it totally different? Because I feel as if it's just the same tools and techniques to just then replace it with something else. Or am I wrong here? No, for some of them it's the same. For some of them it's the same. Um, particularly the people, there was a, a generation of, uh, of people who were, who were uh, involved with um, lorry theft. They were, they were, they were um, stealing from the backs of lorries, then they moved up to stealing the whole lorry. In some cases hijacking the lorry, holding up the, the, the driver, etc. And they were well situated. They were, that, that generation, I guess we're talking in the 90s now, that generation were well situated for bringing in lorry loads of cannabis. They knew about transport. Um, they knew uh, drivers. They knew bench drivers. Um, increasingly, they had contacts abroad. And Amsterdam became very, very, you know, it's cliche, but it's true. Amsterdam became very, very important for making connections. And lorry loads started coming in. And these were people who, when they were teenagers, were mini gangsters, Street corner villains, maybe selling a, a few ounces of this, a few ounces of that, uh, and they moved them from there. They moved them from there. You know, within 20 years, that's what they that's what they were doing. So that that mindset again of ducking and diving and doing a deal became very very important. You back it up with a bit of violence, not not doing the violence, but actually having it there as a resource, as a backup. You know, that became important because none of these people arrive in the market fully formed. There's a story to how they got that, so how they got there. So certainly when you're talking about lorry loads of cannabis coming in and then um, large parcels of, of, of cocaine coming in, yeah, the, I think the, the skills that they picked up from their dads, picking it up almost in the air, you know, it's part of the culture, it's part of the way of life. You could apply that to, you, you could apply, and they did apply it to, to, to drugs, so that became important. When you get to the, the higher levels and, and you get large, large shipments coming in, I think it's quite interesting that I did a lot of work with um, uh, heroin importers. Um, we interviewed, I had a research team that interviewed uh, people in prison. And it was really interesting as far as heroin was concerned. It was different. Heroin was different from, from other drugs. With, with heroin, it, it was important to have um, businesses become important. If you had a business, if you had a business, it, it could just be a corner shop, travel agent, transport firm, whatever. That became important as a base, so heroin became important. But also, um, we found with, with people who were dealing in heroin, they were far more tight-knit in so, so much as the people that they worked with. It's people they knew, people they were related to, people who came from the same culture, the same country, 
Um, all of that became important because the movement of heroin across the globe is quite complicated. You know, it's quite it's quite complex. So the, the heroin dealers always seem to be a little bit different. They seem to be a little bit different. This is not on the street. This is getting it into the country. Once it's in the country, hit the middle market, get it out. Why are they different? Um, the punishment if you get an ex is, is, is huge. You know, you, you are going away for 18, 20 so it's, 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 it's big. Um, it's a relatively small market. It's a relatively small market compared with other drugs. With, with, yeah, with compared other, to with cocaine and weed. But it's also, it's, it's also the way it's looked upon by, by a lot of people still. You know, it's looked down upon by... Is that because of the damage it does, though? Yeah, I mean, 80% of drug deaths are heroin-based, mm. opioid-based. Opioid so a lot of people will shy away from it, or say they shy away from it, um, b b because it's, it's still regarded as, as dirty. It's still regarded as dirty drug. It's not a recreational drug. It's, it's, an, addictive, it's an addictive substance, it's an extremely addictive substance. So... That's kind of shied away. That's kind of shied away from, but that that connectedness, it, it, they're pretty tight. We found that those um, those um, heroin networks were, were very tight, not loose net at all. Very very tight. Whereas the other drugs, it was you know, yeah, cocaine's more glorified. Like I've sold everything. Like, but dealing with people who smoke weed's totally different. It was always yeah. more calmer. People always paid on time. Cocaine's a different one as well. Like it was always sharp shifty kind of people recreational join themselves but it was always harder to get the money because then as time goes on it becomes a major addiction as well because people don't think it's, it's extreme i used to do gambling i was a gambling addict but i used to look around and i used to bought the coke at the weekends and uh, i used to look around i used to look down at people who were homeless and maybe full of heroin and i used to think look at the state of them if you've got addiction problems for me it's all the same yeah it's, it's all battling what's your what's your opinion on addictions did you ever work on that didn't work on addictions, but but work with a lot of people who were addicted mm -hmm. um, via the trade that they were in. Um, taking their own stuff. Yeah, taking their own stuff. Cocaine was interesting for that. You know, I remember there was one there was one group we, we looked at. A guy got into it, a middle class guy. He was a designer or something, self employed, and he was he, he was going to dinner parties and cocaine was being used. He wasn't using it, but some. Um, they ran out, they didn't have any. And he said, well, I met someone on all of I think is a dealer, I'll just give him a ring. He gave him a ring, that was it. Suddenly he's in the business. Suddenly he's in the business. Suddenly he's, he's bought for, for this little group of people who have dinner parties together. Um, and he moves on from there. He moves on from there and he gets a bit more, he gets a bit more. And suddenly he's got a network of people that he's providing for. And he tries it out. And he became addicted because it was endless. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of an expensive business to get addicted to powder you know it really is which is where crack comes in but but he said it's an expensive business but he had an endless supply he had an endless supply so he was making a lot of money he was putting a lot of it up his nose and that's where mistakes come in that's where but mistakes come if in. the human mind you know you're doing wrong i always knew i was doing wrong even though i knew drugs were destroying me why do people continue to do it though is that with the conditioning is that with the neural pathways then reprogramming the brain to just becoming the norm. Yeah, it's a normal. It's it's an enormous buzz for people to do to do wrong. I mean, early on, I think it, you know it starts off early doors. It starts off when you're a kid and you're doing wrong, and it's a buzz. When I mean, you get away with it, it's an absolute buzz. And some people get addicted to the chaos. I mean, for me, I don't like chaos. I like I like order. You know, I like order in my life if I can get it. But it, it, but but for for a lot of people, for young people in particular. You can get addicted to the chaos. It is really, really exciting. You know, it's a, it, 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 it's fantastically exciting. You know, talk to bank robbers. Talk to robbers about going into a bank and doing a bank. It's it's gone now that world, of course. But when they were doing it, what was it like? What a buzz! What a buzz! They enjoyed it. They got an absolute buzz out of it. They like they liked it. It was it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. And that can that can you know that that can become part of you. That can become part of who you are seeking enjoyment it's like skydiving or something you know yeah the adrenaline kick yeah does the chemical balances come into play when you're getting the dopamine rush from taking drugs or robbing a bank where the adrenaline's pumping and you're feeling alive like see when that comes back down is that when these these men really feel insecure and unworthy and not as important and they get older yeah, yeah they, they, they get they get old they get older and um, you know we change we change as we get older in our attitude to to order and chaos so it's very very hard if you're doing a 10 stretch and you're not getting that rush anymore and you know when you come out your family's no longer there um your house is no longer there 
you're 10 years old, you maybe you're 50 years old, you, you can't do another 10, 15 after this, you can't do it. What are you going to do? What are you going to replace it with? Um, there's nothing to replace it with. You, you, you can't do it. Some of this, I know some, some really interesting villains who, who got absolutely addicted to the life. They loved the life and drugs was part of it, but doing crime was part of it as well. Guns was part of it, threatening people was part of it. Mad chaos, craziness was all, was all part of it. And then something happened, it was usually a, a prison sentence, usually a long prison sentence, or nearly getting a long prison sentence, and they get pulled up. What am I going to do with my life? And how do they change? Well, they, a lot of it's to do with ego. They've got big egos, some of these guys. They, if they can redirect that ego, if they can redirect that energy that they've got, real energy. You know, I mentioned Bobby Cummings. Bobby um, worked with a charity uh, for people who were coming out of prison, couldn't get mortgages, couldn't get insurance. It, he was actually part of changing, getting the law changed so that these people could get it. You know, amazing. But he did it by applying that energy. And when Bobby looks at you, you know, it's like you give him the money. He's still got that about him even now. You know, he's, he's coming up for 70, but he's still got that about him now. And another guy I know, Joe Baden. Uh, Joe was very much part of that life. He... Um, he runs, a, he runs a, an organisation at Goldsmiths called Open Book, which takes people from um, addictive backgrounds, from mental health backgrounds, uh, from criminal backgrounds, and gets them started in education. And he, he's not a soft sober, he doesn't treat them lightly, but he gets them in and, and, and does good things with them. But he does that by applying his ego and applying the energy that he had when he was a bad boy. And some of them can do it. It's a hard trick to pull off. Yeah, change is hard, and which we'll touch on now. Like my life was full of chaos for thirty odd years. I've been visiting prisons since I was fucking old, as young as I can remember, three, four years old, visiting uncles and stuff like yeah. that. And when your life's full of chaos, like I'm, I've totally tried to rewire the brain, stopping the negative things that I think were holding me back. But sometimes when I'm happy, I think, why am I happy? Because I'm used to the chaos, and then I think about something negative, and then it feels normal again. <laughs> How hard is it really for somebody who's been institutionalised for 10, 20 years to then come out and try and make changes? I think it's really hard. I think one of the saddest things that I've seen is you're talking to people who have spent a long prison sentence at a key time in their life when they're in middle age, if you like, and they come out and they've got a choice to make. And a lot of the time they go back to the same mindset that they had previously. If, even if they're not actually doing crime, they're still strutting around like they're, they're, like they're Jack the Lad. They're still strutting around like they're, like they're, like they're, they're, they're cock of the walk. And, and that's, re that's really hard. The people I've seen make it is often via education. It's often via education. They start to read. They start to study and they get a sense of worth and well and well being really through writing an essay and someone saying, This is really good. And they've, no one said that they're really good at anything before. And suddenly they are. It doesn't matter what the education is, it doesn't matter what the course is. If they can get into education, if they can read, if they can start to 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 think about not even think about their own background or anything, think about something different. Do architecture, do Italian studies, do, do housing studies, do whatever. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a discipline. It's something they can apply themselves to. It, it's a hard trick to pull off, particularly, you know, usually these people who haven't done well at school, they're not particularly good at reading, writing, whatever, but it is possible to do. And the people I've seen who have been successful when they've come out, yeah, education's been important to them, really, really important to them. Um, it's quite interesting. I spent some time in his latter years with... with um, with Charlie Richardson and, and Charlie talks about that he talks about education being very very important and he was he was an interesting guy in so much as uh, he was an old villain that's what he was you know when I knew him he was an old villain um, he was no longer doing villainy but he, his, his, his attitudes he was still there you know the, the attitude to making a few bob and uh, his, his attitude to um, he was interested in that he, he he wasn't like your, your stereotype villain, villain who, were, who was uh, in favour of the Queen and, you know, old England and all of that stuff. He wasn't like that at all. He didn't like royalty. He didn't like the aristocracy. He'd done a bit of reading. He'd done some reading on sociology, some psychology and stuff. And he was like fervently anti-establishment in many ways. And yet, in other ways, he was very much an establishment figure. You know, he was the epitome of what... A, a 60s gangster was all about far more than craze I, yeah. I think 
Knowledge is power, though. The brain will, will only repeat what it knows, so it's to feed it new information, new knowledge to then. I question everything. I always question everything. I question my methods, my agenda, your agenda, your methods. Everybody sees the world differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily because you've read from a book that it's all right information. Yep. You mean you could read your book, The Now the Business, and pick up totally different things yep. night and day. Change as possible. Always promote that shit. Anybody can change, but you've got to work tireless to then rewire the brain to then be thinking different, to then create and change the patterns that you've already knew your whole life, which is a difficult thing because the brain will just repeat it's and take you back, trick. which is the trickery of it. But the beautiful thing is it can be done. It's but, trick. I'll just say at, at that point, you know, in, in my own situation, when, when I was at school, I, I was... Um, I was useless at school. I, I was no good at school. I was told I was stupid. I was told I was stupid at school. I was told I was stupid at home. Um, I came, we had 31 kids in a class. We had two exams a year, you know, one, in, one in summer, one in winter. And I came 31st. I've still got my reports at home. I look at them every now and then and shudder. And I came 31st every year, every year, every exam, right the way through my school career, except for one, and I came 30th. And the only reason I came 30th and not 31st was one of the girls in school got pregnant. It didn't turn up for the exams. So I, I got a promotion to 30th mm -hmm. from 31st. But I was always the mug. I was always stupid. I was told I was stupid. And I, I, I acted stupidly for an awful long time. It took me a long while to actually see that, actually, I might have something to say. I might have some worth about me, you know. But, yeah. But in the back of your mind, back of your mind, there is always that voice. It's just because a teacher or your mum, your dad yeah. saying, "Who do you think you are? You're a mug." Every successful person I've interviewed, there's always been somebody that's trying to stop their dreams. If they've said to their teacher they want to be a boxer or a football player, they said, "Nah, you need to get an office job or an eighty-five. I've never believed on them. That's why it's important for people watching or listening. People's opinion of you doesn't have to be, be your reality. You create your own reality. You create your own life. You create your own worth. But it's difficult if you're not in a good place. You must dig deep to then find some light, which is, it's not impossible. Everything is possible, but it takes time to then try and register. That even these conversations, people will still pick up information and go, okay, that makes a bit of sense. But then they'll forget about it. But then something, down, yeah. six months down the line, it might pop back up again and then they sure. can start making the changes. What kind of, when you started talking to villains, what, who's the villains you were speaking to at first? Well, uh, at first, and, and for the majority of my career, I've always talked to villains who are not big name villains. I, I like the the why port, is that the poor. I, I don't know. Were they, they they're the ones with their lives. They're they're the ones they're the ones who are, are in the pub. They're the ones who I was introduced to. They're the ones who are actually jumping up into the back of the lorry and, and coming out with God knows what. They didn't know what they were nicking, and I just found them more interesting than the serious villains. It's only later on. What's the I difference start. between um, a serious villain? Like even if I see a hat man. They're still getting used. Oh yeah, you're you're a pawn in, in somebody's game. Like all these henchmen standing next to the villains, the everything's a, a game of chess. Like these people are getting used. So the villain, even the main, I know some serious serious people. The ones who are t proper dangerous. Oh, dangerous. They're not dangerous with violence. They're dangerous here. Yeah. Because they get everybody else to do it. They move it like that. The, 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 the the orchestrate in the chess game and it's the ones who go oh, he's dangerous the hat man but is he though he's just getting used so he that's a man for me doesn't really think for himself that's a man that's letting somebody else manipulate him to go and do bad things well the people i was interested in were, were kind of they weren't being manipulated by anybody the, the people i was interested in were it was it was um crime was part of their life but not all of their life you know it was part of their life it was just as indeed, it was a classic, classic East End thing. Crime was always there for everybody, and you could dip into it as you wished or not. It, 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 no one was forcing you to do it. So no one at this stage was being manipulated. They were robbing a lorry. They were stealing a lorry. They, I mean, one guy stole a, stole a lorry and told me what he'd done and, and told me to watch Police, Police 5 on you know, the old Shaw Taylor thing that was on a Sunday afternoon. So I watched Police 5 and there's him driving the lorry because they, they needed somebody, the police needed someone to go and pick the lorry up when it had been found emptied out of all the, of all the loot. He was the person who stole it. He was the person who emptied it out. And the, he was also the person who then went and drove, drove it around the, around the track. So it was kind of, it was like ordinary. It was a little bit cheeky. Yeah. It was a little bit impudent. It was people having a go, people saying, I'm not a mug. I've got a shitty job or I've got no job. But actually, there's something about me that, that's all right. So... I can get this for you, I can get that for you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So I started off with those people, um, and then I got introduced to, I started to get introduced to people who, who, were, who had been successful, 
who have been successful, have made some money, who have made some money and invest in it. Because most of the villains that I've spoken to, they don't see themselves as villains, they see themselves as businessmen. They say, oh yeah, I did a bit of this and that. That was early on, but now I've got a business. You know, I, I'm, I'm legit. Imported. Sorry? I'm legit. I'm legit, yeah, I'm just yeah, a businessman, yeah. I'm just a businessman. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a villain. Oh, I did, that was, that was all, that was 20 years, 10 years, five years last week. You know, that's when I did that. But I'm, I'm not really a villain. They don't accept. They don't accept that at all. Now I'm straight. Now I'm straight. And this is this is what I do. So I'll tell you what I used to do, and that's usually how I get into the conversation about what they used to do. And then yeah, you meet her several times for a drink and get to know them and blah 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 blah. And it turns out they're still at it, but in a more minor in a more minor way. I started to get to to meet some of the more, if, if you like, the iconic names, the people we know, uh, through working in the media, through doing some media work, and. Um, I did some work in the 90s, um, I did some BBC work and um, came into contact with Frankie Fraser. Yeah, he was a proper villain. He was the real deal. He, he was the only one I've ever met. There was nothing about Frankie that wasn't to do with crime. Everything was to do with crime. Very bright, very sharp. Um, I worked with him in the 90s on a programme and then I worked with him in, in the late 2000s on, on, a, on a programme. On a, uh, for, for a TV programme and I always liked talking to him because he, he didn't try to bullshit you it was absolutely straight this is what I am you know what do you mean businessman I'm a villain this is what I do and I'm really good at it but he also had that intimidating thing about him he, he genuinely was intimidating. I mean, Frank was I think 5'5 five five. Um, a small man but he had something about him he had an aura about him that was intimidating right to the end you know I I think he was in his 80s when I last saw him and, and he was still, this is who I am, this is what I do. But he, he loved it. It was, with him it was joyous. You know, when he cut people, he talked about how he used to cut them and he'd do this and do it. you flinch and oh no, you know, yeah, I did this, I did that. And he was this and he was that. You know, he, he spent over 40 years in prison, didn't have a day off of good behaviour. That, that, was, that was him. He was a criminal. It's what he did. It's who he was. It's, it was his identity. There was nothing else about him that wasn't to do with that, you know, that wasn't to do with, with crime. And he had a, a mind like a trap. He could go back and talk about yeah, 1938, um, some magistrate's court, the name of the magistrate and, and, um, and Jack Spot, uh, grasped up someone else in that court and he knew the guy who did it and knew his uncle and knew his relations and he knew it. That was his world, you know, he really knew it. And if you said something, I, I spent a lot of time with him and you, if you said something that was wrong, he said, no, you're wrong there, boy, because it was bang, 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 bang. This is, this is what I am. But the intimidating thing, when we went, to, we went to meet him, I was doing a radio program for Radio 4 about crime in the Second World War and that's when Frank really started to get involved, you know, in, in, in crime. And we went to his flat. He was living in the Angel then. And um, we, I was with a BBC producer and we, we, we rang the, uh, the entry phone and a voice came. He said, hello, uh, hello, the, hello uh, Mr. Fraser, it's, uh, it's BBC here. Hello, this is John Major, who was the Prime Minister. This is John Major. And we looked at each other. God, he, he really is mad, Frankie Fraser. You know, he's bonkers. What's going on? What do you want? John Major here. What do you want? Uh, 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 just joking, boy, come up. So he's got you, you know? He's got you. That manipulate. That's what proper gangsters do. They manipulate. They manipulate. So he's got you on the back foot straight away. And then we walked up the stairs and he was waiting for us outside his flat. Now he's five foot five and he's standing with the light behind him. He's got his jet black dyed hair, you know, jet black shiny hair. He had a smart shirt on, tailored trousers. And he was standing at the top of the stairs above us. You know, he knew what he was doing. Everything about him was about manipulating the situation, presenting himself in this intimidating way. Once we got in his flat, he was an absolute gent. He was very good. Fantastic. But that is who he was. That's what he did. And he was a wind-up merchant. The second time I met him, I met him in, um, off the Walworth Road in a pub there. And um, I was having a drink with him. He used to drink um, vodka and lemonade. And... Um, he got a bloke dressed up as um, Sherlock Holmes to walk about behind me. And he was dressed up in a full cloak with a big pipe and everything. And he was walking around behind me just to wind me up, you know, that was it. And that was Frank, that was what he, that's what he did. He was, he was a funny man, but he was 100% villain. What was his upbringing? Straight family. 
um, he, he, he regretted, he, he, he said on a number of occasions, he said that um, he was at a disadvantage in the criminal world because his family were all straight. If he'd have been from a criminal family, they'd have known what solicit a phone, they'd have known how to do things, but he didn't. As he said, he had, to, he had to find out for himself how to become a criminal. And very early on, I think he was about nine years old, he was working for the Sabinis, the, the race, course, uh, race course operators. He was working for them as a bucket boy at the, at the race courses, wiping down the, uh, the blackboards of the, of the bookies and getting, and getting paid. So he, he started off when he was, when he was just a kid. And, uh, and he loved it. He liked crime. He liked crime. He liked criminals. He valued loyalty. That old, all that old-fashioned loyalty and respect thing which I'm wary of, and it, usually it's a complete con and they're all stitching each other up. I, he wasn't like that. He was, he was proper old school, which is why he ended up doing over 40 years inside. Yeah, I know we talk about people, though some of these men can be intelligent and smart, but if you're serving over 40 years in prison, you're not that smart either, are you? Doesn't seem that, doesn't seem that smart to me, but it was a way of life that he, that he mm -hmm. chose. It was a way of life that he chose. And when you, when you read the the beatings that he took. And, and when he talked about the beatings that he took as well, you know, he had the, he had the birch, he had the cat and nine tails, and he was badly, badly beaten when he was, when he was in prison um, by, by, the, by prison staff, you know, and he dished it out as well. It was, it was a way of life. Violence was a way of life, 100% way of life. He liked money, he enjoyed money, but violence was really important to him, and villainy was everything, yeah. absolutely everything. They become anti authority and again, that's what we spoke on earlier. Majority, in fact, everyone that I've spoken to has been bullied or abused. They get beatings, they get yeah. the hatred, or certain things can trigger them. Where they just where they have that fuck it button, yep. and they just don't want to take it anymore, and yep. they snap. What about the craze? Like everybody's fascinated. I remember watching the craze film. I think in the nineties, and I was like, wow, bad men, respected, nice suits, money. But there's a lot of darkness around the craze as well. Like, why do you think they're still people still speak about them even today? Like me speaking about them. Why do sure. you think that is? Um, they're a throwback to the 19th century. They're, they're, they're something out of a dark East End. Uh, they're, they're, they're something out of Jack the Ripper's time. There's something out of the Gothic East End about the craze, you know. Um, they, they, were, they were street fighters. They were street fighters. They, they modelled themselves really on the, on the street fighters who were around Hoxton and Bethnal Green at the time when they were young men. That's what they were about. But there was two of them. You got double. You got twi two of everything with them, and I've spoken to. Them. I didn't know. I didn't know them. I, I I missed them. I was too young, but I've spoken to a lot of people who were around the craze, and they said, they've all said the same thing. If you're in a club or a pub and they walked in, you could feel the atmosphere change. It was two of them. It was double trouble. If one was going to hit you, the other one was going to do it. So you got two. You got two of everything. But the other thing was, it was the time. You know, they were, they, were, they were products of their time in many ways. They, a lot of these villains that we talk about, you know, we all know that we know their names, the Train Robbers and the Freddie Foremans and the Richardsons and the Crays, that era who came to prominence in the 60s, they'd all been evacuated as kids. They'd all been evacuated in the Second World War. They'd all been sent off to the ends of the earth, to Suffolk, to Devon or whatever, away from home. And things happened to them. They saw things and things happened to them. They were not treated very well, they were partly starved, they weren't fed properly, sometimes they were abused, sometimes they were beaten. They would be the cockney kids in the local school, in, 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 out in the sticks. I think evacuation, the evacuation and the Second World War, the bombing of the Second World War, and all of that had a big impact on that generation, a massive impact on that generation. As far as the craze were concerned, um, they came along just at the right time. You know, a pair of street fighters, they were boxers, by all accounts, they weren't particularly great boxers. Charlie was, the older brother, he was a good boxer. But they, these were boxers. But, and then those everybody boxed. The big, a lot's made about the craze boxing. Everybody boxed. My dad boxed at school. They boxed, everybody boxed. That generation, they boxed like we play football. You know, that's what they did. Nonetheless, the craze did box. They were fighters, but they were also street fighters. They got a local reputation, as young men do, as young men still do to this day, in their area, they were territorial, they had their territory, and that was it. But things were starting to change in London. London became quite a, a, an affluent city. There was a lot of money flying around, even in working class households. The money was floating around, there was full employment for the first time in the East End. It never had it before in its, in, in its history. There was full employment, there was money floating around, and there was opportunities coming up. 
to, to transfer your violent reputation and, and monetize it, commodify it, to make money out of your violent reputation. And the craze did that. Now, they were just one of many young men at that era, during this era, all over London, all over any big city, who were street fighters, they had their street corner, they had their council estate, they had their little few streets. That was theirs. Playing that tune. That was theirs. And they started to commodify. They started to make money from it. So they started to take protection money, going to pub, going to club, going to Billy at all. This place is going to get smashed up tonight if you don't give us 50 quid, 20 quid, 10 quid, whatever it happens to be. Um, they didn't give it to them and the place got smashed up. So that's how they started off. It's absolutely crude, goes on all over the world. That's extortion. That's what gangsters do. That is the definition of a gangster. It's extortion. You're taking money, threat of violence. That's what you do. So the craze were doing that alongside lots of other people. Their violence was extreme. They were willing to use weapons. They were willing to use weapons. So they caught the eye of some, old, of some older gangsters. But things were starting to change again. You had the, I, I think, when you think about the craze, you've got to think of, of, of some key changes in the 60s to the law. 1960, the Gaming Act, which made gambling legal, which opened up the West End to the craze, which is where they wanted to go. So that opened that up and they went into it. Uh, the other thing was the, the end of uh, capital punishment for murder. That had a big impact, you know. They, they lived out their lives in prison as opposed to being tops. So that was important. And the other thing was the, the, the law regarding homosexuality, that it was illegal to be gay, as we now term it. It was illegal. And because it was illegal, it meant that Ronnie Cray in particular had become part of this homosexual underworld, which included members of parliament, members of the House of Lords, aristocrats, and that gave him access to all kinds of things, in particular blackmail. And that made him very strong and very powerful. So it's a weird mix. It's a mix of murder, um, sexual deviance, as it was regarded at, at, at the time, changes in the law with the Gaming Act, and you've got two of them. It's weird. It's weird. But they had a, they had a genius for two things, and that was violence and publicity. They were good at public relations. They were excellent at public relations. I mean, having David Bailey, the, the, the top photographer of, of, of the day, taking your wedding photos, which is what happened with Reg, and taking family pictures, which, which I mean, how bizarre. I mean, if you really want to be a villain, you keep your head down and you make your money and you're quiet about it. But they liked publicity. If they were around now, they'd be on... Uh, they'd be in the jungle with Ant and Deck. They'd be on Celebrity Come Dancing. They'd be doing all of those things, quite literally, you know, because they liked publicity. They enjoyed publicity. And that is why I think we're still talking about them. We've got the photos. We've got the photos. We've got the David Bailey photos. We've got, that. We've got those. We've got several films on the craze. None of them are very good. Lots and lots of books, of which only about three or four are any good. We're obsessed by them because they, they became the poster boys for what we now call organised crime. At that time, we didn't use the term organised crime. It wasn't mm -hmm. used. But were they really that organised? People in, in yeah. higher states really keep their cards close to their chest. I don't think they've ever done that. And then they think, Ronnie, with the young boy, I, I don't know if it's 100%, was he not caught in bed with a 14-year-old boy when he gets sent to prison? For me, that's a fucking nonsense. For me, that's dark where people... You shouldn't really be respecting that. I get it. I, I remember watching the film and going, wow, man, like, that's unbelievable. Then obviously when you start interviewing people, you realise how dark the fucking stuff went with yeah. the craze. I don't know if Reggie was gay. Do you think that's where the battle as well, with the anger, the frustration, the violence, because they were gay and they, they had to keep it under wraps as yeah, well? Yeah, I think, I, I think that did, I think that had a, a, a quite, an, quite, an imp, quite an impact. I, I think they, yeah, in terms of what they were, well, they were, they were local villains, they were street fighters um, who came along at a certain time Britain was changing, there was jobs, there was publicity, television, people started to get television. I mean, they got interviewed on the BBC. The pair of them got interviewed on the BBC, that clip's available on YouTube. It's bizarre, it's absolutely bizarre. They were absolute one-offs. In terms of the sexuality, I think, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's absolutely bizarre the way that people idolise them. Having been brought up in the East End at the time when they were busy, uh, when they were very, very active, 
everybody knew about them. I mean, it is very, very strange. You know, people would talk openly about them. I would have crazed this, crazed that. When um, uh, George Cornell was, was killed in the, uh, in, the, in the Blind Beggar, I was still at school then, but we were talking about the crazed killings. We didn't know George Cornell's name, but we knew the crazed name, and we knew where the Blind Beggar was. Um, so we were talking about, it. oh, the crazed did that, didn't they? Did they? Yeah, that's right. My dad said, oh, all right, bang, bang, bang. It was very open. It was a very strange time. It was the 60s, and it was a very strange time. The sexuality, the sexual deviance, the, the paedophilia, uh, is something that um, is it, bizarre that, that, that that's not a blind eye being turned, but it, it, it's, it doesn't feature enough as far as the story is concerned, because I think it, I think it had a, a I think it, it, it had a, a major role in the way in which they progressed their careers. I really do. I think it was important. Yeah, I think was it George Cornell the code, and then I think they had a blackmail the the somebody in Parliament, but I think the footage of them with a kid got destroyed. And that's why I think they got their life sentence because they thought they were getting away with it. That's yeah. the information that I had that they yeah. had somebody in, had judges, fucking politicians had so much dirt on people, but the information they had all get burned and they I, never had I've that. I've heard those I've heard those I've heard those yeah. stories those story, those stories as well. But the they, they were a bizarre couple. Yeah, I they can't were, I can't respect They were very, they were very no, I don't respect any of them. They're, they're just kids, to, me, yeah. to me they're just they're part of history. So yeah. it's not it's not an issue of of, of respect. But I think the question you've asked about, you know, why do we still talk about them? I think that's really interesting because, you know, we've got a visual image of them. That's what a gangster looks like. It look, they look like the Craig Twins. Whenever anyone's coming through, even now, things have changed so much. They're coming through now. They're compared to the Craig's. How often do you see they're worse than the Craig Twins? They're not as bad as the Craig Twins. They're the benchmark for villains. It's very strange. I've heard policemen say it. I did a big, big project in the, in the 90s and... Um, we interviewed top police officers and everything. All they wanted to talk about was the craze. You know, these these were people. These were people who were who were in, who were in charge of investigations involving, you know, tons of drugs coming into the country, the the way that crime is getting organised and globalisation and all that. Actually, what they wanted to do was let's have a drink and I'll tell you about when I met Ron Cry. This was, what? and this was police officers no. wanted to wanted to talk about that. So they've become the benchmark. They've become the yeah. benchmark. And, and these films, they don't help. I mean, they, they're absolutely dreadful. They really, they really don't Yeah, help. but crime sales. My, crime big, my biggest views are criminals. Yeah. But the people who interview, I'm very well connected now because of the people I interview and what I'm doing. The craze weren't the biggest, the biggest money makers. Oh, no. They weren't the most violent. There was people bigger, stronger, yep. more organised. But again, it's the PR work of the promotion of the craze. Again, that all comes down to the stuff and the information they had against other people to then promote themselves as that. They made more money when they were in prison than they did out. Yeah. They, they just did. It, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's what they did. And, and they've, they've made the careers of other people as well who have, who have got, come, come out on the mm -hmm. bandwagon. In the straight, from the straight world, you know, that, that's, been, that's been important. But it's bizarre. I, I, I find it bizarre. You know, if you compare them with the Richardsons, the Richardsons were far more... Well organised. Uh, yeah, they were serious. They were serious people. They were, they were more modern criminals. You know, Charlie Richardson was a was a modern criminal. He was an entrepreneur. He was always looking ahead. Right, right. So as I say, I only met him you know, towards the end of his life. But even then, he had this about him that he was kind of thoughtful, manipulative. You know, Charlie Charlie had this great, great thing where he was uh, he contacted several authors and said that he was going to he had new material to give them for a new book. And it, it, the idea was he contacted several authors and told them the same story, including me. And I, he died before I signed the uh, before I signed the contract. But I thought it was really funny because that's, that's what he did. He couldn't stop himself. He, you you made you made money. But he was a smart guy. He was a smart guy, and he, he always he always spoke well about education. He wasn't someone who wallowed in being a villain. He didn't wallow in being a villain. He didn't wallow in violence. He didn't wallow in any of that. He was very pro um, education. He'd educated himself. He encouraged other people to get educated. And, um, you know, in his latter years, I certainly had a bit of time for him. It's funny that, isn't it? Like, you're a well-educated man now, and you've wrote numerous books, but yeah, I speak to murderers and bank robbers, and there's a level of respect there where I like them. I know they've done wrong. What is that? How can, even though you know you've done wrong and you're, you're trying to teach right and wrong, like, for you to then 
like someone involved in a life of crime and done what they've done and destroyed lives. But how can you get that connection when you think you're you're okay? Like yeah. I see the I try and see the goodness. What is that? I, I think it's about being humble and, and just and just seeing that you could be in that position. I think it's about background. If you come from a, a sort of working class background and you're talking to working class villains, no matter what they've done, you can see ways in which that could be you, quite easily be you, no doubt about it. You know, easily. I, I certainly go over a situation, I think, oh, lucky I didn't do that, lucky I didn't get caught for that, lucky I didn't do that when I was a kid. You know, and that's, it's, it, starts, it starts with that. But I like it when, you know, if, you, if you're talking to villains and they're thoughtful about what they've done, they're not always, you know, they don't, they're not always repentant. They're not always all saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done it. And, and, and uh, you know, some of them are saying, oh, I'm glad I did it because I had a real good time. I made a lot of money. I spent it. And uh, I just wish I hadn't got caught. I kind of like that as well because it's honest. There's an honesty. It's like, it's like talking to Frank Fraser. There was nothing, there was nothing snide or... or or no, no back dealing with, with Frank. He was, I am a villain. This is what I've done. I can't tell you everything I've done because I didn't get nicked for all of it. But actually, you know, it's me. This is, this is who I am. And I kind of like villains like that. I've got several really good friends. I mean, seriously good friends who come to my home. I go to their home and, and I've stayed in contact with them for a long, long time. And, uh, and I always will. And um, they've done things that, Mm, that probably wasn't a great idea. You probably shouldn't have done that. You probably did a bit of damage there. And, and they go, yep, yeah, I did. I did the damage. I did that. I did that. No. But I put shoes on the kids' feet. Yeah, but what about this? Yeah, shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done it. Mm, took a risk there. Didn't work out. Bash, bash, bash. And they try to make put it right. They try to put it right. But they're balanced. They don't all say, they don't discuss. I mean, some of the interesting guys are people who get religious. I think mean, they're really interesting, you know, and, and they've they're done terrible things, but they discover religion when they, when they go into prison and they go on a course, I think it's the Alpha course, they go on the Alpha course and they come out different people. And if that works for them, that's fine. If they're able to, to, you know, generate that energy into a different direction, that's absolutely fine. But it's rare. And the, the people, I, people that I know, just they acknowledge, yeah, I did some bad things, did a lot of good things as well, really had a good time, time to move on, time to change. I kind of like that attitude because we're all like that, really, aren't we? You know, we all we we can all look at things we've done and regret it. I won't do it again. Actually, I enjoyed a lot of it, but I'm older now. I've got a family or whatever. I move on. Yeah. What do you? So, with you studying these characters, and what have you picked up the most of un, interviewing villains and, and connecting with them and becoming friends with them, even though they've done right, yeah. even though they've done wrong, they've done good, they've done bad. But what have you picked up most? What have you understood more? The, I, I guess, I think the attraction, the attraction of doing crime is really something that stands out for me. Uh, I didn't like, and I don't like now, uh, in uh, certain spheres of, of academic life, when all criminals are presented as being abject nutcases um, who, who are irrational in their behaviour. Yeah, there, there's an element of that. They're over there. They're in that bucket over there. You know, I don't deal with, I don't deal with them. But... It's, it's rational to get involved in crime. It is rational. If you're from a certain background, it makes absolute sense to get involved in crime. It's not good, and it's not good for your head after a period of time, that's for sure. I've seen you know, a lot of problems being developed by th when people start to think about what they've done and reconsider what they've done, but it's entirely rational. It's entirely rational. When you talk to a bank robber about getting hold of a gun, going into a bank, and coming out with a quarter of a million pounds and then going somewhere warm and spending a quarter of a million pounds, you do start to wonder what that's like. You do start to wonder, oh dear me, you know, imagine having a quarter of a million pounds. You're not had to work for it. You're not had to wait for your pension lump sum in order to get hold of that money. You do start to think, and you start to think about yourself. You start to think, would I? Could I? You're not gonna do it, but it, it, I think intellectually, that's the way to go is to think about you know, what makes me different from them there's not a lot you know it's a hair's breath yeah. between me and them it's a hair's breath it's a hair's breath the people I interview I still think fuck what if I get bang involved again man the connections that I have to do this do that I'm thinking bigger bits more money this and that your mind does go a wandering yeah, and yeah. That. what is that then like for you to try and understand the brain understand like sometimes I can think and argue with somebody and I think I'll fucking kill you you cunt 
But what is that? You, you, before you know it, you've killed them in five different ways in your mind. Does that <laughs> make you psychotic? What is? You don't act on it, but what does that? What well, is that? Well, well you're not you're mind? not acting. You're not you're not acting on it. I think it's, it's it's entirely rational to go through all the possibilities. Is that normal though? Yeah, yeah. If you're from a certain background where you, you know where you're expected to to hold your hands up, where you're expected to react, where you're expected don't let anyone lay their hands on you. Um, th they're the rules when you're growing up, you know, from a, a straight, respectable family. Don't let anybody do this. You must respond. You must respond. And, and, and yeah, and, and some people do. Some people, some people actually do those things instead of just going over them in their brain and then calming down and saying, right, okay, that's out of the way. I'll put that somewhere in the bucket over there. That's, fin that's, that's finished. But some people will do it. But are they that different from us? I don't think they are. I don't think they are. The odd, the odd people are. I mean, Frank Fraser, come, coming back to him, there was a man who liked violence, who did violence, who didn't mess with ordinary people. He, didn't, he just didn't mess with... He, he despised ordinary people. They weren't worth a punch in the mouth. You know, he just didn't regard them as being proper people. He hated them. He hated clerks more than anything else. He hated people who wore suits and went to work in a suit. He hated those people. He hated those people. You know, those people are different. The Frank Fraser of this world are different. I think... Also, what's changed is the, um, the drugs which are around now. Uh, use of cocaine in particular inspires violence, you know. Inspire. If you have those thoughts when you're on coke, you know, you might do it. There's a better chance of you doing it if you've, if you've used coke and you, you're thinking, oh, I can kill you, you can't. Here we go. Yeah. It might happen. It majority might happen. people in prison and stuff, look, the majority of people who do murders are intoxicated with something. Absolutely. And that's the scary thing. Look, Alcohol triggers the, the anger and the frustration in the brain as well, where I believe it's the most glorified drug on the planet because people just think it's a great lifestyle. It's fucking, there's so much shit we can get into in detail, so many different things. For ordinary people, alcohol is the big struggle. For, yeah. If I look at the villains that I've known and the people that I've known who have got involved in villains, I don't even call them villains, really. these are ordinary people, people who have done crime in, in, you know, since I've been looking at all of this, and even though before I, I went to uni. If I think of them now, you know, how, how have they finished up? Um, alcohol and tobacco are the big ones. Nothing exotic, really, the odd, the odd one or two, but the majority of them is drink and cigarettes. And as they get older and they can't climb in the back of lorries anymore, they can't jump over counters in banks, they can't do this stuff, they end up slumped on a sofa with a, a, a bottle of supermarket vodka and um, a big pack of old oven. And, and, and that's the end of them. And that's when, and that, and that, you know, by the time they're 50, they're old, 60. Not many make it into their seventies. It's but, it's a yeah. it's a hard life, but that's what's happened to working class people generally. And the villains is just part of it. Have you ever spoke to people and thought you shouldn't even be on the streets? Because I speak to people and I think, man, you've still got that glare in your eye where I can see you still doing a murder. Yeah, yeah, I have, I, I, I have, and um, it's I've I've not been concerned that they can do anything to me. Hey, you're not that to threaten anyone. I'm the most, you know. So these people, if I say, oh, I'm a professor in a university and I'm doing this stuff, to them I'm a complete no mark. You know, you work in a university, you're some pencil neck who works in a university and, oh, yeah, I'll talk to you, all right, okay. And it, it either works or it doesn't work when we have a conversation. Sometimes it doesn't, usually it does actually. Usually we get around having a chat and it works out, it works out all right. But yeah, some of the people that I've, I've met, um, yeah, they are dangerous people and they shouldn't be on the streets. Um, they might not have a criminal record. Um, that's the other thing, you know, we assume that criminals are people with criminal records. No, that's not the case, you know, there's, there's people out there who haven't got records. There's a lot of people out there with records who are barely criminal. You think, well, how did you ever get nicked? The answer to that is it's a lot easier to get nicked now than it used to be. You know, since I started, I wrote my first book in 1988. What was your first book? It was called Doing the Business. Okay, what's that about? It's called Doing the Business. That's about the um, street... It's about ordinary crime, ordinary people doing ordinary crime, the jump up merchants, the duckers and divers, the people what you know, people I works with and it's, it's that kind of stuff. And some stuff about detectives as well, because I spent some time with them. And so I, when, when, when I did that, that was 1988, uh, prison population, I think it's 40 something thousand then. Now it's over 80,000. Doubled. It's doubled, it's doubled. And there's so many, it's so easy to get nicked now. And drugs has got a lot to do with that, you know. People get involved, they go, oh yeah, I'll just carry this bit of, can you take this parcel over there, take it over, drive it over to the other side of London, can you take it over there, you're built right, and it's 500 quid for you, 200 quid, whatever it happens, yeah, yeah, do it, do it, do it once a week, you're laughing, you, you're earning a week's wages in, in an hour, it's absolutely fantastic. 
And then you get stopped. And then you get nicked. And then you go away and you find yourself facing 10 years, eight years. I, I've, I've known people and, and gone through the, the records as well. I had the prison records to, to, to confirm it. I've seen people who have been working, for instance, been working for a guy who runs a club and they're, they're a gopher. These guys are gopher. They do a bit of driving, they do a bit of cleaning, they tidy up and everything. And the governor of the club says, um, uh, put something in the boot of this guy's car and he said, let's drive over to such and such. They're driving off and they get stopped straight away. Eckler and Cox coming through the window and everything. Whoa, what's going on? The driver ends up getting 14 years. The governor, who's the drunk that he is, who's sitting next to him, gets two years because the governor has got something to trade. The governor can trade. The governor's going to be out in a year, 18 months, and he's got something to trade with old Bill. The gopher, the gopher, he's got nothing to trade. He don't know what's going on. He's not going to trade anything. He gets the 14 years. There's a lot of people inside like that. There are a lot of people who are, who are just remotely connected to the drugs trade. But it's, if it's a serious amount, you're going to go away for a long time. Mm. And that's what's happened. Since I started doing the work in the 80s to now, drugs just... And the drugs trade, everyone can, anyone can get involved. You don't need a background. You don't need a family support you don't need uh, an uncle who speak for you or you don't, you don't need any of that anyone can get involved in it all it is is getting together some money you know i could go out there and see a mate of mine how much we got we got 500 quid between us right you go off to amsterdam and he's back tonight with a bag full of pills and we're all international drug dealers it's as easy as that yeah. and we won't get nicked first time but you will get nicked the next time because you're greedy and it's not a good idea but it's easier it's not like getting together and you know robbing a bank, getting together, and, and, and even like lorries and that sort of thing. It's, it's different. It's easy, but it's easier to get nicked. Yeah, but to have an easy life is just to work your ass off naturally. Like, it all ends in disaster. Like, I know so many people who do so many different things. It's not that they're bad people. They're no. genuinely not bad no. people. They're no. just good people making bad choices that then brings in negative emotions. What do you think of karma? I, I'm not with it myself. I no, you're not with it. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not with it. I'm not with it myself. But I, I, I do know a lot of villains who are. When they come out, they go, "Well, I deserve it." It, it, it was. It was mm. going around. I'll give you. I'll give you a great example. A good friend of mine, jump up merchant, backs of lorries. He always had this to sell, that to sell. Lots of gold. Great guy. Fantastic. And he always said, "I'll never do anything that's nickable." And by that, he meant, I'm never going to do anything that I can really go away for, you know, if, if I get caught. And I'm not going to get caught anyway, so that's it. As the years went on, his health declined. He, he gets, you know, he has a couple of heart attacks and he, things aren't working out to where he can't climb over, over walls and through windows. He can't do all that stuff. What am I going to do? And in the end, he gets, he gets asked to, to get involved with it in counterfeiting. What you got to do? Well, uh, just pull this lever. Pull this lever, and it's twenty pound notes. So he's pulling the lever with these twenty pound notes, and he's promised. He's promised. Like, I think it's four grand a week or something. He was promised. He starts to pull it. He starts to do it. He's in a caravan somewhere in the middle of nowhere, pulling, working this lever. He gets so much for every twenty pound note. And what he's doing, he's putting the foil on a twenty pound note. This is a number of years ago. This is thirteen, fourteen years ago. So he's putting the foil down on the note, and that's it. He does all of that. He's never been away. He's never been nicked for anything. Bit of fighting, but nothing serious. And he gets nicked. He gets nicked. As he says, the biggest old Bill I've ever seen in my life come in and, and nick him, treat him. He's like, every gentleman. He's old school. He said, every gentleman, this guy. But anyway, it, the case comes up. It's the biggest case of counterfeit in the UK he's ever seen. Um, I think it was £14 million. This is as a one-off 14 million pounds, but later on it's been multiplied several times over. They've realised that it's, it's much more than that. And he gets described in court as being a lieutenant in an organised crime network. And he said in court, what do you mean lieutenant? What do you mean? I'm not in the what's going I don't understand. Organised crime, all I was doing was pulling a lever. He ended up getting five years. Now he went to prison at the age of 58 for the first time. And... He's come to terms with that. He says he, he, he cried for the first month. He cried. That was it. What am I doing? What's going on? He came to terms with it. He started to do a little bit of reading when he was inside. He became a listener and he worked with other people and he became, you know, he came out. He's justified that by saying karma. 
He said, all them years, all this, I did this, I did that, I whacked this, blah, 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 blah. Calm, I had to go away. Best thing that's ever happened to me. So it's a, it's a justification. It's kind of, he's it's, it's making sense of chaos by suggesting that it was, mm. that it was karma. And he has become a bit of a community resource. He, he helps people out. He goes to housing disputes as, and speaks for them and everything. He's got the confidence now to do it. The only qualification he's got is this certificate saying that he's a, he was a listener in prison. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It, it meant something to him. Yeah, and it's I think that that's thing. fascinating though that, that that you don't believe in camera. That's like that's a good thing because I, I I genuinely do believe in it. I believe if you do good, you will attract good. But it doesn't necessarily your life's going to be perfect. Bad things still yeah. happens. Yeah. You're still going to lose loved ones. You're still going to things are going to trigger you. But I genuinely believe the majority. In fact, everybody I speak to, when you kind of break it all down, something does catch up with them. That's why they always want to do good. The people who do change because they think okay the conscience starts growing because the, the brain's a sponge, it absorbs everything. So no matter if you're blocking it out or placing it down in a wee box and you don't think, okay, I don't want to think about that, the conscience mind eventually pops up somewhere, at least the most unexpected times when you start thinking. Because when I was going through my changes, all the bad shit was repeating what I was actually yeah, doing, yeah. what I was involved in. And then you start getting sad and down because you think, fuck me, like, is that what I really done? How did, I, how did you never think of it then or feel it then that, you knew what you were doing. It's because you try and block it out and then it eventually comes to a head and then you think, okay, I'm going to start doing good. Then I started doing homeless work and then I started doing a, helping out people who are suicidal thoughts and try to help out as much as I can to try and put good back in the world. Do you think that's just you then thinking? No, I, th I think that's unusual for you. I, I, I've heard older people say that. I've heard mm. older people, after they've done their bird, after they've had umpteen heart attacks, because it's a chaotic lifestyle. You can't keep doing yeah, that forever. It's, you know, it's absolutely draining. And, and they're old, but by the time they hit 50, they're old, usually. Mm. They're, they're, they're old because of the chaos of the mm. lifestyle. You know, it's, it does get to them, you know. It, do, it does get to them. But you're unusual. What you've said is unusual because for someone as young as you are to stand back and rerun this stuff and to try to change, to try to change things, that's kind of unusual because usually the thing is, this ain't working out. I'm feeling bad. I better do more. I better, I better have two lines. I better, I better, you know, do a bigger deal. I better take more risk. I better do more, do more, do more, do more, do more. It becomes, and that in itself becomes addictive. But stepping back at the age you did to 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 rethink your life and to start to do good for other people and everything, kind of unusual, kind of unusual. Because most of them, they do get on. Like this guy, fifty eight, when he goes when he goes away, mm -hmm. you know, he he, he was. You could have made a, sit a comedy sitcom about him, uh, when it, his life. His life was great. Being out with him was the best. Being in a pub with him was the best. It was always funny. It ended up, it ended up in a, in a sing-song or a fight or something. You know, it, was just, it was just good to be around. He was, he was good to be around. But he did a lot of bad stuff as well. He did a lot of bad stuff. And it was only when he went away at, in his late 50s that he started to reassess. He came out and he use this the notion of karma in order to make sense of his life he, he uses it then but that's in his late 50s doing it young is unusual most of the guys most of the guys that i know uh by the time that by the time they start to get to the point where they could be thinking about their lives and reassessing their lives they're fucked that they, they really are the the booze the chaos the i mean i've done stuff with guys who were, who were wheeler dealers and buying stolen goods and everything. And they were up at three in the morning, driving to a, a lay-by off the, off the M1, meeting up with a lorry there, having a fried breakfast, going somewhere else, having six pints of lager, having it. Did that, do that for 20 years. You're not gonna, you know, you're on your way out. They, don't, they never get to the point where they do be able, are able to reassess, reassess their lives. And it's very difficult. That's why people like Joe Biden, Bobby Cummings, people like that, I've got massive respect for them because they really did. They really did pull themselves up and they did bad things. Yeah. They did bad things, but they, they, do, they do pull themselves up. What do you think of the prison system? It doesn't work. Um, I think we're heading into a, a phase at the moment uh, under the current political regime where we're going to, um, you're going to see bigger sentences, you're going to see bigger clampdowns. Um, 
and um, conditions in prisons are only going to get worse. It's starting to come like America here as well, though. Yeah, it is. It is, particularly with privatisation and a private prisons. Even though people tell me that if they've been in a private prison or a public prison, they say that some of the private ones are better conditions than in the, in the public ones. Nonetheless, the idea of people making profit out of misery, out of locking people up, is something that, for my generation, I find it very hard to take. You know, Slavery. Very hard to take. It is. It's awful. It's, it's absolutely awful. But we're putting more and more people away. We are, you know, we're putting more and more people away. We're inventing new, new ways to, to house them. It's just warehousing human beings. Um, whenever I've been into prisons for visits, I, it takes me about a month to get over it. I just, you know, just going in and seeing people if I know that, when I know them, seeing what they're, the, the conditions they're in. Um, I've never seen anyone come out better out of prison. Not really. They, they, kind of, they can make a story up about what happened to themselves in prison and everything, and they're reformed and everything, but... It doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't reform people. It, it dehumanises them, and uh, I've, I've never seen anything different. Uh, particularly when it comes to young offenders, you know, we we're not talking. Particularly at the moment, you know, what's going on in the news at the moment. We, we're not talking about this enough. We're not talking about young offenders. We're not talking about the conditions that young offenders are, are, are held in, and uh, the way in which really these are, you know, young offenders institutions are just. Um, preparations for for a life of crime uh, how can it be anything different how can it be anything different the way it's the, the way that uh, the way that, that things are so yeah i can't see it getting any better yeah it's scary but there's still a lot of goodness in the world as well there's still a lot of good things that happen it's just again it's that mindset everything's for the mind for me everything's the mind everything goes away back from schooling as well like what do you think about also things passing down from generation? Addictions, anger, frustration, people yeah. on the bloodline. What do you, what's your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, given that I've stayed with uh, some of the people that I've stayed with for, for like most of my life, uh, some of the research people that have worked with research is now 40 years. And as I say, I'm seeing their kids, their grandkids, great grandkid, in one case, great great grandchild um, coming through. And it does get passed on. As a way of life. Now, I don't know if it's. I don't know if this is. I don't go down the chemical imbalance route because I don't know enough about that. I go down the social route. That if you're a boy and dad's coming in every few nights, he'll come home, or every few days he'll come home, and he's pissed up or doped up or whatever it is, and he's using a certain language, and he's making his money in a certain way. Uh, no matter how loving he is. No matter how uh, emotional he can be, no matter if he takes the boy to the football and everything, that idea, that's what it is to be a man. And it's about masculinities. It's about, that's what it is to be a man, to be this tough guy, to be this thief, to be this chaotic geezer who's out of his brain on this or that. That is what gets passed on. That really does get passed on. And I see that particularly from fathers to sons. And I've seen that a lot. I've seen that, I've seen that a lot. It's It's a... It's very difficult and it's a difficult chain to break. Because if dad makes it look attractive, you know, why not? If dad's driving a nice car, why not? If dad's taking us away on a nice holiday, why not? You know, and, and again, it's rational. It makes sense to, well, do the same thing. Yeah. Kids I'll become a reflection of their parents there. Eh? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. So socio the sociology side of things, because it's, it doesn't just come into behaviours and stuff like that. Like, there's so many different... Yeah. things involved with it how did why how did you end up getting involved with that well it made sense to me when i went to um i started to go to night school when i was working i was working as a because you've done things prior to that didn't you at university yeah was yeah you're not doing law as well no no I, I i i was um my only connection with law is i was uh i worked in a law department i was a professor yeah, yeah, of law yeah, for, yeah. for a few mm -hmm. for a few years but i i got involved with sociology because um when I, I was going to night school and i was working um I was working as a road sweeper and a dustman and then working, um, going, going to night school. And um, I was doing um, politics, A-level A level politics I was doing. And uh, this, that, that was all very interesting, but I, I knew a girl who was doing sociology and she, she telling me about it, why don't you come in one of the classes? So I went in one of the classes and there was a, a guy there and he was talking about East London. It happens to be East London. He was talking about. It. He said, "Oh, there's this book at East London, and all these people are like this, and they're like that, and they're always stealing from each other." And they're like, "Whoa, hold up! I'm not having this. You know, it's a bit more complicated than that." 
oh, what do you know? Well, that's where I'm from, and that's not good enough. You've got to read some books. Oh, I'll, I'll read some books, and it was like, all right, I'll, we'll oh, have sure a go. Him. I'll show you. I'll show you. So I started to read some books, and I started to get involved in it. It seemed to be an interesting discipline for me. There was bits of politics in there. There was a little bit of psychology, not a lot, but there was bits of politics in there. Um, and it, it kind of made sense to me, particularly a lot of the old stuff. Uh, I mean, I, you know, first day at university, I got there and someone was talking about a book called East End Underworld. Oh, well, that sounds all right. So I got hold of the book, took it home, read it, showed it to my dad, and my dad recognised people in the book. I thought, oh, it's, it's, this is real life. This isn't abstract. It's not something weird, some floaty thing that's in a library uh, in some ivory tower. This is real life. Dad recognises it. Dad recognises the streets. I recognise some of the pubs. This is interesting, even though it went back, you know, to early 20th century. My dad knew about it. So that really, that really triggered it for me. But housing's got a lot to do with it. You know, the way in which in all of our big cities, people have been shifted out of the... People talk about the inner city. Well, in most places now, it's not the inner city. The inner city, people can't afford to live there anymore. They've got to move out. They've got to shift out. It's too expensive in the inner city. They've got to go outside. And if you want to know about crime, if you want to know about these crime networks, you want to know how things work, you take a step outside. As far as London's concerned, from my point of view, there are certain parts of Essex that you go to, which are, yeah, that's, that's, that's where you can talk to people. As far as South London's concerned, go to the Medway towns, talk to people around there. That's where things go on. They don't go on, it doesn't go on in the inner city anymore. It's changed, it's changed enormously. Yeah. Gentrification, price of property, People can't afford to live there. I think the pressures of life, living, not having money, can be trigger points of people going down the bad route and doing the bad things. Yeah, people don't want a box of shirts anymore. They don't. They, you know, that's not, that's not good enough. You know, they turn on the TV, they turn on their phones. They're they're they're, they're, they're seeing people with with money, with gold around their necks. They're seeing you know at the moment. Or, or I think they see is celebrities on on exotic islands having <laughs> having holidays. You know, it's driving yeah. me nuts. We can't get out of the country, and <laughs> and they're on they're on these islands. You know, so it's all about envy. It's all about let's be like them. It's all about let, let's be like them. And that's what kids want. You know, that's what that's what kids want. It's what younger people in particular want. That's what they're after. They want real riches. They don't want a box of shirts. They don't want a little bit of dope to use at the weekend. That's no good to them. They want to make proper money. So they want to be millionaires overnight. You know, that's the way that's the way to be. And crime is offers apparently an opportunity to do that. What's your opinion on money? Opinion on money? Um I'm glad I, I got more than my parents said because yeah. they didn't live well. Why do you think we crave it so much though that it is only a piece of paper? Do you think we're not showing enough gratitude towards life for what we do have? We still do have a roof over our head. We still do have food in our belly. I know people who's got nothing are the happiest people in the world. I've interviewed billionaires and I think, fuck me, man, you're not happy because it's constant hustle, 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 yeah, hustle. Yeah. And I think, shit, that'll be draining. Because people, everybody looks at the world differently. The hustle is addictive. Yeah. Particularly for men. Yeah, it's, it's good to hustle. It's great to hustle because it keeps you alive. You, you see people retiring at 65, 70, <laughs> they end up fucking dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you kind of just stopped. It's good to consistently grow and learn. But the, the money side of things it is an illusion that we crave it so much because, yes, we need it to survive. Of course we do. But it's just the way it is now. But it's not everything. It's not everything. To make but, you happy. But we've commodified everything. You yeah. know, it's, you know, I mean, just going back to my own experience of going to. Uh, going to university, you know, it was, it was free. It was free. To go to university for my generation was free. If you could get there, it was hard to get there. It was only five or 10%, between five and 10% of the population went to university then. Now it's, I think, 50% that go, so things have changed. But it was free to go. Now it's not, now it costs money. It costs a lot of money to go to university. You're paying, you're paying fees to go. Um, which means there's a marketplace, which means the universities are vying with each other for, for students. They're climbing over each other to get students in the place and they're letting students in who shouldn't go. Uh, some people who should go aren't allowed, to, uh, can't go because they can't afford to go. It's, it's a marketplace. If you create a marketplace about everything, about knowledge, about life in general, if, this, if that's a marketplace, then yeah, it's, it's, it is all going to be about money and that, that tends to be... What's uh, what's happened when I when I see the kids and grandkids of some of the old jump up merchants that that I knew when I was a kid and knew through the seventies and eighties, um, when I when I see those kids, they haven't got the skills that their parents had. 
They couldn't jump up into a back of a lorry. They wouldn't know how to get into a container. They wouldn't know how to replace the lock on a container. They wouldn't know how to do any of those things. But they desperately want serious money. Not money to get by, not money to pay for maybe holiday or something. Serious money, and they want to be able to show it. It's no use having money if you can't show it. That's there. If you've got it, flaunt it. Yeah. And and that 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 I think has, has has made a big impact. And that's where a lot of young villains go wrong. You know, they get money and they flaunt it, and sure they get enough. nicked. Yeah. They get nicked so yeah. so quickly. It's untrue. Yeah. Whereas the the guys who when when I've done these these big projects, particularly the European projects uh, on on drugs and, and drug markets, the guys who manage to keep going the longest before they get nicked, and they usually do get nicked in the end, but not always. But the guys who manage to keep going the longest are driving. Uh, an ordinary family car and they're living in an ordinary house and they are t they are just keeping their head below the parapet but for young people brought up in a culture where everything's flash if you've got it you've got to flaunt it it, it it's hard for them yeah for me that that's that, that seems vulnerable to me now mm. that um but again, I'm still learning and growing. That's why I love these kind of conversations because I'll pick up a lot from yourself. That like even changing interview techniques and picking up different things. It's everybody knows something that we don't, so it's always good to pick up new things. How many different sh human behaviours are there? Is there a limit to them, or is there? Is there no, there, it's evolving all the time. I mean, particularly marketplaces. Oh, yeah, you know, we are in a marketplace now. We don't live in a, in a society. We live in a marketplace. We're all buying and selling whether we like it or not and you know i don't like it you don't like it but we're involved with it so and that's it that as, as those markets evolve then market behaviors will evolve as well and 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 that will that would lead to changes i mean i've got two sons they do jobs that didn't exist when i was a kid they just didn't they, they didn't exist and I, I know lots of people like myself and my, my age it's hard to understand what their kids are doing because the marketplace the job marketplace yeah. has evolved See, when you're sitting next to someone when studying the human behaviours, is there a, a limit of different behaviours that people react to? Like when you're interviewing criminals, the way they sit, the way they function, confidence, low confidence, low self-esteem, can you pick up on that? A lot of that's generational. A lot of that's generational. Is that changing? Uh, yeah, that's changing. That, that's changing. I, I saw it start to change big time in the late 80s into the 90s uh, with body shape. When um, going to the gym, getting big, using using steroids, uh, using a lot of weights, that became marketable. And now that was going along. There, there's a reason for that, and, and there were changes that were going on in the cities. Our cities were basically shut down, and nothing was going on in the cities. Deindustrialisation, factories were gone, mines were gone, everything was docks were gone. All these traditional jobs were gone. They they were just emptied out. The only way that those cities could function was by selling alcohol at night. So you've got the nighttime economy blowing up. And it just got vast in the late 80s into the 90s. It got enormous. Um, and you start to see bouncers on the door. So if you went to Manchester, I think it was when we did, we did a big research project in, in the uh, late 90s, in the 2000s on, on the nighttime economy. Manchester was one of the sites that we looked at. Manchester, I think one square mile in the city centre, up to a quarter of a million people on a Friday night then. I don't know what it is now, but it was a quarter of a million people then. And there was like 20 cops dealing with a quarter of a million people. You get two fights and they're all off the street. But there was an enormous, there was hundreds and hundreds of bouncers dealing with, that, dealing with those people. So muscle became marketable. Muscle became marketable. And people were started to work the door who hadn't worked the door before. And it was about getting big. So when I'm talking to that generation, and when we did the, the bouncers work, and I worked with some really smart researchers, really good guys that I worked with on that. When you're talking to that generation, they are their bodies. They present themselves in a certain way. They are their bodies. And, and they, that is, they're all about violent potential. That's how they're selling themselves. It's about that. But then you talk to someone like Frankie Fraser. Well, Frankie's dead now. He died, I think, 2014, 15. But you talk to someone of that generation, you know, five foot four, five foot five. You know, I can think of another guy that I spoke to about the same size as Frank. I was saying, why do you use guns? How can you use guns? You see, it saves time. And I don't get my suit messed up. You know, that, that's, that, that, that's it. So I think different generations have got a different way of coming across. They've got a different way of coming across, a different way of presenting themselves. It changes. And a lot of that old school stuff that you get from the 60s and everything, you know, when you talk to those people, they've got a completely different way of presenting themselves 
most of them were not big. Most, they could look after yeah. themselves because they were straight people. They were working class straight people, but they weren't big people. Get the younger ones, you know, they're all big. They're all big. They're all massive. They're spending a lot of time in the gym and it's narcissism. It's about how big I can be. How do I look? All of that becomes very, very important. Persona. It's about persona in front. Particularly yeah. when they're talking to an old guy like me. Yeah, you know, talking to an old guy like me, then, then they're going to want they they want to present themselves in a certain way, in a certain way. So one of the ways of presenting yourself is to be intimidating, be big and intimidating. You know, I don't care. I've been around this that world for so long. It doesn't get anywhere. After about ten minutes, good as gold. You're chatting away, and they're telling me actually they'd like to do a psychology course at university. Yeah, that's the usual way they, they talk about. So you you get that you get that kind of response, but then you get some of the old guys. Who aren't actually that old? Some of the, some of the guys who are in their fifties have modelled themselves on the sixties gangsters, and that's interesting. They turn up suited and booted, silk tie, slicked hair, very neat, very tidy, and they talk about respect and they talk about this and they talk about that, and they're, they're selling you a line. They're selling because the respect thing, really, you know, doesn't exist. Good idea, but yeah. really, really makes for a good film. But we've all seen The Godfather. Mm -hmm. We've all seen The Godfather, and um, it doesn't really work. And on that subject, you know, they talk about The Godfather, one of the big changes in the policing of, uh, of crime, serious crime in this country, came about in the 70s because of The Godfather. Because the British police had a language to use about crime, so there was people going into, going into court who had been involved in skullduggery of one sort or another, and the police were saying, he's a Godfather. And they were using the language from 1973, from The Godfather. And they were saying, you know, he's a this, he's a captain, he's a lieutenant, he's a this, he's a that, he's a that. And it comes from films. So the police are very adept at selling these stories in the same way that villains are when they talk to you. It's interesting. What do you think of the mafia? What's the, have you ever studied them, their movements, the organisation, how well it's run? Yeah, there's, there's a myth that it's run well. It's used, it still operates on a cell. On it's a still cell, in Italy. Cell cell it start from Italy and then move to America. Yeah, it start, well, it started in, in Italy, moved to America. The American model is is an American model with links to Italy. Um, I think that that's true. Uh, I'm not a scholar of the mafia, but I've certainly used a lot of, of the of, uh, mafia studies to try to understand the links between. Um, different countries and the way that that, uh, that, that organised crime organised crime ac actually operates. I think one of the one of the problems we get with the mafia is that the mafia. It's a bit like the Cray twins. The mafia provides a benchmark for organised crime, and it provides a language. So, as I said, from the early seventies, you start to see the police and other agencies using language that they've got from the film, but the media as well. You know, they talk about. Um, they're the uh, the Battersea Mafia, or they're, they're the they're the the Brixton Mafia, or they're the Doncaster Mafia. It it people know exactly what it means as soon as you say Mafia, and you tag that on to the end of a place. It's really scary. It's really it's hyped up. Then you actually look at these groups, and are they really that organised? Are they really that structured? As far as the 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 actual Mafia are concerned, they have become far more businesslike over the years. Do they impact on the UK? Do they come to the UK? They loaned the money through the UK. You know, if you want to know how the mafia, the impact of the mafia on, on the UK economy, you look at the city of London and you look at the movement of mafia money and illegal money that goes through, goes through it. Back in 2008, when we had the, the massive recession, uh, it was uh, estimated by the uh, United Nations that uh, it was only illegal money, much of it mafia, but illegal money generally, that was keeping the banking system, the global bank banking system, uh, going. Because that was fluid money. They, their money had to move all the time. It's coming and going, and coming and going, and coming and going. So it kept it buoyant, it kept it going. Um, so really, this idea of an underworld is a bit of a nonsense. It's an overworld, and we're all reliant on it. Look at the amount of scandals there's been in recent years of why our major banks in this country um, have, have been involved in, la in laundering of illegal funds. You know, they, they, they just have. We're not in an underworld, we're in an overworld. Who was it? Did somebody not shut the docks down in New York and they had to get the mafia release them from prison? To yeah, them? Second World War. That was, was, that uh, Luciano? That was Luciano. That was Luciano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luciano. Luciano was, was uh, in exile. He was, he was in... Um, he was... Uh, in Italy at the time was he? Anyway, it was Luciano. It was Luciano who who arranged for that because there was a, there was an issue ab about um, uh, the fascists uh, planting bombs on the waterfront, and uh, they wanted to investigate it. 
So it was, I think, it was, it was the uh, it was uh, the, the naval security people went to uh, went to the mob who ran the waterfront. They, they ran the waterfront. They ran the unions and the waterfront, and they wanted people. They wanted to keep keep a lookout for. Uh, for, for people planting bombs and plotting against the, the American government. What it actually did was, if you, when you look at that closely, uh, that actually resulted in um, the, the gangsters on the waterfront uh, killing off um, members of alternative, uh, uh, their, their opponents of saying, well, they were, uh, they were fascists. They were working for, for, uh, for fascist sympathisers, so we killed them or we passed information to the uh, to the security services that got them taken out of the game, and that often happens when you get these collaborations between official sources and organised crime sources. Organised crime are usually a lot smarter, and and they'll they'll select the targets for the state to do their dirty work for them. But that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. Mad, what about fear? Why is the human mind? Why is human beings so easily controlled by fear? I. I like when you see these gangsters and you talk about persona, they could be five feet and five yeah. and not fight sleep, but yet you think, I'm just really scared of him, but yet you could probably have a, a tear up with someone six feet two, 18 stone. Why is that? Like some certain personas, you're really fearful. I think it's the knowledge that they're willing to do, to, to go beyond. Is that what it is in the brain, to condition the brain that you're scared of it, something? It's people scared beyond, of heights. They're going somewhere like different. They're, they're going to they're gonna take a dispute Mm -hmm. to a different place they're going to do something that you wouldn't dream of and, and one of the things that I've yeah you know, I've enjoyed my, my job over the years up to retiring and, and it's, it's been really good and I've met some fascinating people some really interesting people but when the only time I've become really uncomfortable is, is not not out of fear because that's never been the case really but it's when they start to talk when some of the people start to talk about the violence that they commit it's not like a punch on the nose or a black eye or nutting someone or whatever, you know. They'll go into deep details about what it is like to put their finger, put their thumb in someone's eye and to gouge it out or what it's like to cut someone or what it's like to do this or do that. And they'll go into deep detail and they do remember every detail. They do remember every detail. And that's hard to take. That's hard to take, and that's relentless. You talk about um, dark places, and you know you you pulled it back a little while ago, and said, "Yeah, but there's some good things in in life, and good things in the world, and everything." Well, I think the the only bad side of the job that I've had is you, you, you it's constantly being engaged with bad stuff. Yeah. It's constantly it's it's hearing bad stuff, thinking about the dark side, reading about the dark side, all the books, the reports, the government reports, the police stuff, I get hold of and all of that stuff, you know. It this is you know, this is this is not bedtime reading. This is not bedtime reading. And um that 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 can be quite difficult. But when they talk, when when those people talk about it, I mean I remember talking to one guy who'd done a a, a nonce in, in prison and that he knew that there was a there was a crossover between his wing and the nonce's wing at a certain time of the day and he timed it and he took a guy's eye out he took the guy's eye out and he described it in such detail and i'm not joking the detail of that simple thing gouging an eye out it went on for about 10 15 minutes you know what it felt like what it looked like the aftermath then what he did to the guy after the eye was out you know and when you're, with, when you're with people like that, whoa, that's hard to take. So how do you deal with that? Because that's what I do as well. I've interviewed over 200 people and it's some fucking serious stuff. Yeah, My yeah, murders, yeah. shootings, stabbings, yeah. people getting chopped up. I've had people talking about child abuse. So yeah. how do you deal with that? Can we get PTSD from that? Yeah, I think I think so. Uh, don't don't want to over dramatise it, but I, I, think it is, I think it is a possibility because you do think about it. Mm. You know, I've, I've met... Um, Journalists who have had similar experiences at all this doesn't bother them at all. I've had other, I've known other journalists, investigative journalists, who have uh, compared um, working with these kind of serious violent offenders to being in a war zone, and uh, the constant um, um, nightmares and, and the memories it has, that it has, and, and it also affects you in other ways. You know, I've got I've got I've got family, I've got kids, and and um, you're constantly thinking. You know, I hope you're all right. I'm all protected. You, you're, yeah, I hope you don't get involved in this. I hope you don't know where you're going and who you're seeing and what you're doing. You, yeah. yeah. I think when my, certainly when my boys were younger, I was I was very, very protective and did all kinds of things I won't go into to just to check on them. 
Yeah, I just did. Yeah. I just did because I, I had a very. It gives you a very pessimistic view of human nature. Yeah, and that's a scary thing because, yeah, like is. I say, there's so much goodness in the world, but the, yeah, the stuff that we dig into, if we're constantly hearing that, if you're constantly watching the news, or if you're constantly reading the newspaper, you think the world's a bad place. You, you do, and when you get close to people as well, some of the people I've got close to will, well, quite rightly, they'll use you as a sounding board when things go wrong. So, you know, I've had someone go, oh, I've, got, I've got to talk to someone, I've got, I need to talk to you. So, yeah, right, come round. And they come round and their, their faces all cut up and you know their nose is in another place on their face from it was yesterday and 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 um, something's gone wrong in the family. It's been a family dispute. This hasn't been you know, like a on the cobbles outside a pub. They'd they'd love all that. Most of them they'd like they'd love it. This is different. This is it's a family dispute. It's a son has done it to him or a, or a cousin or a brother and they've done something to them and the, 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 the brother's in hospital and. All right, and what am I going to do? And you get the tears, and you get the, you know you you get that side of it. So you you act as a sounding bowl for them, and you you end up talking to them about what they might do and calm them down and and that kind of stuff. Um, so I found for some people, not for everybody by any means, but for some people, you know, I, I'm I'm someone they can go to. Or I have been in the past, someone they could go to and, and talk about this stuff, which is fine, which is which is good. I'm glad they trust me enough to do that because everything that I do. Always anonymized, no problem. No one gets damaged by this. I change everything in order to to make everybody safe, and and they know that, you know, they they know that I wouldn't let them down. So I'm I'm glad that they trust me that much. But it can be wearing. It, it can be wearing. It can be difficult. Yeah, you, you just know. need to protect yourself. So breaking it all down then. Yeah. What's your reflection on it all? Is there certain trigger points for people to turn into different pe- pe- to go down different routes, or is there a certain thing that sticks out in your mind where People go down the addiction route or becoming angry. What's your rundown and everything that you've learned through the years interviewing people with the kind of criminal mindset? I, I, I think... Or is everybody just totally different? No, there are, there, there are, there are types. And I, I think one of the big things is, is, is this thing about markets, the way that markets have emerged. That when the markets that I started off with when I was a kid, looking at when I was a kid and understanding when I was a kid, when those markets were, were relatively benign, you know, ducking and dying, the boxer shirts, the leg of lamb, this and that and the other, yeah, there were serious villains and they did damage to each other, but it didn't affect ordinary punters, ordinary civilians. And they, you could get involved with it and then walk away from it. You weren't joining something. You, weren't, you, weren't, you didn't see it as a career. Most people didn't see it as a career. Some did, but not many. You know, it was just something you could do. The way in which we've changed society, the way in which we've made the inner cities impossible to live in for ordinary people the way in which we've marketized everything and everything's got a price on it and the way in which that um young people in particular are, are sort of desperate for 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 goods for glossy shiny goods and to show how rich they are to have the car the watch the jewelry the holiday whatever the way in which we've done that i think has been really really damaging and i've seen that you know from through my lifetime, I've seen that those changes take place, and I've seen a breakdown of the way a breakdown of the way that people live. That they don't live in communities anymore. I don't want to shine up these communities. It's not all like East Enders and we're all in the pub having a sing song. It was never like that anyway. But there was an element of looking after each other. There was an element of looking after each other, and bad things happened in that, but they didn't dominate. Nowadays, everybody's in an island in their own house, behind bars, behind locks. It's very, very difficult for people to live. And I think that's damaged people's minds and damaged the way that they, they see life. In terms of addictions and in terms of people's engagement with this kind of world, um, there's more to be addicted to now. The, the, the commodities which have, which have come into the country have made social life, everyday life, markedly different, you know. We had alcohol, which we've never been to cope with in this country at all. We've always had a problem with alcohol, and that's not gone away. But now we've got other drugs which are coming in, constantly coming in, and constantly mutating as well, constantly changing. These drugs are constantly changing, which, which makes it, it very, very difficult for people to, 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 to cope with. And they create markets on their own. They create markets on their own, which are very easy. It's easier to engage with that marketplace than it is to actually deal with the commodity. You know, you... Take this parcel, here it is, take it over there, I'll give you 50 quid. You know, if you're a school kid, you're going to do it. 
you're going to do it. You don't have to be forced to do it. You're going to go, yeah, I want that 50 quid because I really want to put it towards a new set pair of trainers because all my mates have got them. It's, it's, that kind, it's that kind of world. So family structures are broken down. That's, that's a reality. And, and the breaking down of fam, family structures means there's very little shape to people's lives. And the main shape to people's lives is engaging with markets. It's trying to get money. It's trying to get rich. It's trying to appear even richer than you are. And, and I'm, as you say, I'm trying desperately. I'm looking at it. I'm trying to say something nice, say something good. I can't. <laughs> but do you think that's you conditioned yourself because you're surrounding yourself with, and looking into so much negative behaviours? Yeah, I think it probably is. I don't know many people that it's gone right for. I don't know many people who have engaged with it. And I know lots of people, the majority of people that I know have engaged with this world in some way. And if they've stuck with it for any period of time, it's gone wrong for them. It's got, they're not living in a, in a, in a you know, six-bedroom mansion out in the mm-hmm. sticks, a bit of mock Tudor and a driveway and a you know, carp, carp in a pond. You know, it, it's, not, it's not worked out like that. It really hasn't worked out like that. Those who have made a few bob and are living around the edges, they're, they're nervous, they're worried, they're concerned, they're, they, they know how they've made a living. I mean, one of the worst things I've, I've seen is you, you, I go out, I have a drink and I'm with a group of people and some of them are villains, some of them are straight people, most of them are a little bit of both. I'm having a chat and it's all very interesting and we're chatting away and we're all of a certain age and then someone will say, uh, Billy's grandson or Billy's son, whatever, is on the gear. And they go, oh. And people slump and don't know what to say. Because drugs have brought a kind of a cloud over people's lives that there's no coming back there's no coming back from it's very very diff- it's very very difficult so instead of having like a family life where you say oh yeah my grandson's playing football or he's doing kickboxing or he's whatever blah 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 you hear those words on the gear and the conversation changes and it gets pretty dark and it yeah so that's what's inside yeah. my head what about for anybody watching that's maybe still involved in a life of crime you've interviewed a lot of criminals the same as myself what advice would you have for them well I'm not going to say get out because you know people that would be naive um, but, but you know be realistic I think be realistic a, a, a lot of a lot of guys I know have been involved in, in crime are delusional about their chances of getting away with it and their chances of um, their chances of the big money if you like uh, uh, it's it's rare that it's rare that people people get away with it. Yeah, some people do. Yeah, that's it. But be realistic and be realistic about what's going to happen when you get nicked, be, because you know prisons are not a, not a nice place. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wouldn't wish it on my well, no, I would wish it on my worst enemy. But that's all. They're, they're difficult places, and the criminal justice system it isn't fair. Justice is the last word to use to describe the criminal justice system, and um, you might get you might get more than you bargained for. Um, and that's it. Again, that's part of that dark place. I, I can't see a way around it. You, can, you might get away with it. Best of luck, but you might not. Yeah, the, there's a very high chance that you won't. And that's yeah. the thing. That from I'm just going from what I've learned from people who I speak to, that like, they never really get out outside of it and up here as well that like they're still battling like the fidget and the yeah. over their shoulder you yeah. can see yeah. some sort of trace. even if their business even if they describe themselves as a businessman yeah. and they've been out of the game for 10 years mm-hmm. you know is something going to creep up and bite them in the arse yeah. is, is something going to go is something going to go wrong am I going to meet up with someone is someone going to suggest this so what if my kids find out how do I explain it to them it's a very difficult world you know and, and even even if you accept that right you do this I'm only going to do this and make so much money and then I'm out. Good idea. Hard to do. But even if you do do that, in your head, you know what you've done. And your family might find out. And your neighbours might find out. And how am I going to deal with this? And also, you might start to remember things that nearly happened or maybe did happen. And you try to put out your mind and, and it's, it can come, come back and yeah, bite you. the guilt, the shame, the regret, the, yeah. the embarrassment, there's so many different factors. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, I just say I've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed talking, talking to you and, and it's, it's, kind of, it's, a weird, it's a weird sensation to look back on, on my 
career, if you like, and I look back at some of the people, not going into a lot of details about individual cases, but they're in the book, and I hope people get something out mm. of it. And make sure people get the book, The Business. I'm going to leave the link in the description. Dick, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thanks, James. It's, um, I'll take a lot from this myself, but I like these kind of conversations, just seeing where they're going, picking up new things, because you're kind of in the same kind of line of work that I'm doing, but I see, I'm seeing, I kind of see things differently. I see the people, I don't know, I always try and put a positive light on when I speak to criminals for some reason, that like I don't see, I, we see the bad stuff, we touch on the bad stuff, but there's always a, some sort of goodness there. They've still got that something about them. You think, man, you're actually all right. And you think how they ended up doing that life. But again, that's just... I always enjoy their... Co- well, always enjoy... Uh, a lot of the time I enjoy their company. Yeah. Because they're, it's the same background and, and they're but for fortune, you know, we could go. So, and that's always in the, in the back, of, back of my mind. But, you know, just to finish up, I suppose, the best nights out, some of the best nights out I've ever had in my life have been with some with, with serious villains, and, and I don't and I don't forget that. You know, I've got to be realistic about it. I don't forget it. Yeah, thank you again, brother. Listen, God thank bless you, you, and good luck with the book. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right. And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.